up on fiber. Okay, Michael started recording, good. Um, on fiber dominated strength of multidirectional um, laminates. Um, I will give a brief introduction um, before we get started to the actual part of the of the workshop. Um, just get this sorted out. Yes. Um, so we, this is now the sixth in a rather long series in the meantime. So we started off discussing the definition of strength of a composite, and then we went into specific um, cases, tensile strength first, then compression strength, and then we moved into shear strength uh, and transverse strength in tension and compression. So today we are talking about how these and um, things that are measured on UD composites, how they relate to the strength of a laminate uh, would have multiple orientation present where damage mechanisms are present. And so how can we use what we've discussed in the previous workshops more in a relevant case where we have multiple angles, multiple plies present. Um, you also have all the links here. We will share these slides afterwards. So you have immediately the links also to a short um, news article about the workshop and the link to the YouTube recording. So the overall objectives are essentially the same every workshop. So we want to raise awareness of all the difficulties, the challenges that exist in testing and, and characterizing the strength of composites to help everybody to identify best practices, to discuss what those best practices should be, but also to identify what the next steps are to lead to better practices in terms of measuring um, these strength properties. In terms of the agenda, this is in UK time, so it might be different in your time zone. After this short introduction, Michael will present the paper that we have shared together with our invitation email. Then we will have 11 five-minute presentations by the panel members that you can all see with their cameras on. Then we'll have uh, first a 20-minute discussion among the panel members. After the short break, we will then continue discussing anything raised uh, by the audience members. And finally, we'll have a conclusion, suggestions for future uh, workshops um, and then we'll close strictly at five o'clock um, and then you can proceed with the rest of your day. Um, just a quick overview of the five minute presentations that we have. Um, I will not go through all of them, but this is the order in which they will be presented um, to you. Um, we've tried to order them a bit logical to group a uh, bit of the similar topics together. Um, you will see that in a minute. So, few basic things. The session is already being recorded and will be posted on YouTube afterwards. Um, we we'll also share the slides afterwards, probably about a week after it, when, when the YouTube recording is all available and we send it to everybody who was registered for the meeting today. Um, and then during the discussions, you can write your questions in the Q&A or raise hands. Um, you're not allowed, you're not able to speak or show your video if you're an audience member, but we can upgrade you briefly to panelists so that you can also um, speak um, like, like the panelists. You can also upvote questions that then we will get to them earlier because that means they're more relevant to more people in the audience. Um, the people in the panelists, they have their camera on now during the presentations. I will ask them to shut them down. Um, only the speaker will have their camera on. Um, if you want to use a general chat, please limit yourself to just general comments and say hi. You can also have first direct chat with people in the audience members or in the in the panelists. Um, unfortunately, this type of Zoom webinar does not allow you to see the participants list. We have about 70 people present at the moment, but the current setup just doesn't allow you to see other uh, participants apart from the panelists. Um, and that's it. Um, we will start with the topic presentation by Michael then. Floor is yours, Michael. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, hopefully you can now see my screen. Is that okay? Yeah. Very good. So I'm going to address the, the question of the relation between the Fiber dominated strength and the UD strength. So, first of all, to recap, at the earlier workshop we had, we came up with this definition of strength. 
that the, the strength of a unidirectional composite is the maximum stress the material can sustain under uniform unaxial load. So this is uh, um, this definition was thought to be the the least unambiguous, uh, least ambiguous definition because uh, if you look at first damage or other factors, it's much more subjective and can depend on how you actually uh, monitor the damage. Whereas the maximum stress is the, the most um, uniform that we can get and is probably the, the, the most relevant parameter. And this can be applied to all the principal failure modes. And we've had the workshops as Yentl has described on the different components. So the question for this topic is how do these strengths relate to the fiber-dominated strength of a laminate? And that's what's really important. And particularly, if we want to go on to be predicting strength of structures, we need to know how the, the individual failure modes and the strengths in those failure modes contribute to the strength of the laminate. So the strength of a laminate is really determined usually by fiber failure. And in principle, we might expect that this should occur at the same strain as for a unidirectional material. The actual stress will clearly depend on the layup and the laminate modulus, but this all depends on the failure not occurring prematurely due to other mechanisms. And in particular, with multidirectional laminates, delamination is always a hazard and can very often result in premature failure, which means that we don't get up to the true ultimate strength the material is in principle capable of sustaining. So laminate failure is really quite difficult. I think it's more difficult than the, the strength of a, a unidirectional material. In this plot here, I've showed a response of a plus or minus 45, 90 uh, naught quasi-isotropic laminate with quite thick ply blocks. And what you can see is that there's some initial failure occurs quite early on, and then we have these two load drops, and that's because of failure of the 45 and 90 plies and delamination. And at that point, the specimen really looks like it's failed and like it's lost its integrity, but the zeros were still intact, still carrying load, and actually the specimen could be further loaded for quite a long way before the zero plies fail. So on one argument could be you would still take the strength of that laminate as the absolute maximum, the same way we, we did for a UD composite when we proposed that definition. On the other hand, once you've had all those other pliers fail and delaminated, the composite has lost its integrity. And if you loaded it in compression, for example, it, it wouldn't take very much load because most of the thickness is gone. So the definition of strength of laminate is, is a bit less clear. So laminate strength really, I would argue, is not a material property because it depends on many factors. Particularly, it depends on the stacking sequence. And a lot of this is due to premature failure. So showing here some results we got some years back where we did quasi-isotropic laminates with different stacking sequences. And we had two different ways of changing the thickness, either by repeating the sublaminates to produce dispersed plies, or by blocking the pliers together to produce what we called a, a ply level scaled laminate. And you can see from the results in that bar chart that they're all different, the strengths are all different. If you look at the, the column on the left is the expected strength of the quasi-isotropic based on the UD fiber strength and laminate theory. And you can see that none of the laminates actually reach that strength, they all fail prematurely. The left three ones are the dispersed ply laminates, which get quite close, but uh, they're also failing before the ultimate failure strain of the fibers. And the ones on the right, block plies, they fail particularly uh, early in delamination. And the thicker the ply block, the earlier the delamination that occurs. But even the dispersed plies on the left, which if you look at them initially, might not look like um, like delamination control actually are controlled by premature delamination, which then initiates fiber failure. So laminate strength is not a material property. The strength also depends on the loading angle. Some very nice work from CT Sun some years back, 
where tested quasi-isotropic carbon epoxy laminates along principal fiber direction and at, at different off-axis angles showed a big reduction when you loaded them off the axis because of this large-scale delamination, which you see in this 22.5 case here. Constraint from adjacent plies can also be an issue and may affect the strain at which the fibers fail. And the example I'm showing here is from some work we did on very thin carbon plies in hybrid laminates. And what we found here was that when we had very thin plies with glass on either side, then the fiber failure in the carbon occurred at a higher strain. And it wasn't a small effect. The very thin plies, we got a 20% higher failure strain than we had for the thicker plies. And the reason for this was because we believe that the critical cluster of fibers does not grow in the same way. And the adjacent fibers in the other plies constrain the growth of that critical fiber cluster and therefore delay the ultimate failure intention. Another potential constraining factor in bending is there's a picture there of a, of a UD composite being loaded in bending, and you're seeing all the fibers on the tension surface splitting off and failing. But if we had other ply orientations on the surface, they would inhibit that splitting off and may therefore affect the failure strain at which the zeros break. The effect of transverse cracks is another issue which is perhaps a little bit less clear, but there's some fairly recent work that we've been doing on this, where we've shown that by having, by comparing quasi, sorry, comparing cross ply laminates with UD and cross ply laminates of different ply thicknesses, we show that there is a bit of a reduction due to the cracks in the 90s. And you can see this plot on the left here, which shows some very nicely captured fiber breaks fairly close to a transverse 90 degree ply crack. And we'll also hear a bit more from uh, Elena about this in, in her presentation. Another uh, factor is, well, what about in compression? Well, there's some, some very nice work from uh, uh, Christian Hoshar and his group uh, on the effect of pre-forming damage in a tube by putting it under torsion and then loading in compression and showing that the amount of damage which is induced during the torsional loading, the matrix dominated damage, drastically reduces the subsequent compressive stress. So again, in a laminate where these effects may occur, then that may cause an effect on the compressive strength. So we've also done some work recently uh, in collaboration with, uh, with Honora on looking at the effect of the ply thickness. So again, this is some work on very thin plies, 0 0.03 millimeters thick, sandwiched between 45 plies. And you can see on that graph there that the single 0 0.03 millimeter ply was substantially stronger in compression compared with the, the, point, the two and the four ply cases. Now, the reason for this is not fully understood yet. One of the factors is that in the very thin case, you suppress the transverse cracks in the, the, the ply which is being failed, but there's also the potential for the adjacent plies to be constraining that failure. But in either case, what we observe experimentally is that we have a higher failure stress and strain in the very thin plies. So a few other factors which may come into play, there's the effect of residual thermal stresses which uh, may be present in laminates, but not in the U day, and therefore they may have some effect. But this, I would say, is, is usually quite a small effect. We also have the possibility of the other stress components, which may be present in a laminate, even when it's under uniaxial loading. And we believe that that effect is very small in tension, but it may have uh, an effect more important in compression. There's also the effect of the different volume material, and Xiaodong is going to talk about that a bit later. Uh, for example, just in a straight UD specimen of the same dimensions as a typical quasi-isotropic, you've got four times the volume material. And since we know that the strength depends on that to some extent, then that may affect the difference between the UD and the, and the quasi-isotropic. However, having said that, then 
for the tensile failure, then if we avoid premature failure and we take account of the stress volume, then we can get a direct relation between the UD and the quasi-isotropic strength. Uh, and Xiaodong will, will cover that. So uh, the references there are in the, uh, in the, the reference in the PowerPoint there, which will be available after the session. And now I'm going to hand back to Gentle for the next presentation. Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, we will bundle all the questions and the discussions after the presentation. So we'll immediately jump to Elena's presentation as she is the first presenter. Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Well, the work I'm presenting today is uh, the motivation is in our previous study on the scale effect, where we um, study the, uh, the dependence on the thickness of the nitrogen ply block in cross ply laminates, uh, the dependence in the appearance of the first damage. Uh, in that work, we uh, saw differences in the damage mechanisms um, as a function of the, the thickness of the nitrogen ply ply block. And we also came to give an energetic explanation of this fact. Well, now the work I'm presenting today corresponds to a broader work in which we are interested in not only in, in the study of the behavior of the ultra thin plies that we studied before, but also its comparison with the thick uh, plies, mainly because Airbus has um, shown us very interested in um, expanding the use of these thick plies to their aircrafts. So um, we propose here the comparison between three different laminates using the same thickness, oh, sorry, the same number of uh, plies in the 90 degree and the zero degree uh, blocks, but distributed in different ways. Um, our objectives were, first of all, analyze the first damage appearance, the, the comparison between them, also the comparison of the morphologies that we observed for different uh, loading levels. And perhaps the point which is more related to this seminar, which is the study of the, of the ultimate loads we, we uh, calculated or we tested for the three um, uh, laminates. Where he got the results for the first damage appearance, we can see that um, there's a difference between uh, the three laminates. Um, the gravity of the first uh, damages is uh, increases as the um, thickness of the blocks uh, also does. Here we can see the difference. Also, if you continue increasing the load, um, we find that um, there's um, uh, this difference between the, the different laminates also increases. I mean, uh, for the case of the thick blocks, we can we can see that there are transverse cracks with. Uh, at the lamination, but if we go to the thinnest uh, blocks, we can see that we can only detect isolated or connected devote. I haven't said it before, but we performed this study, but uh, applying gradual um, increases of the load. And after each uh, increment, we go to the microscope and we observe the damage that uh, appear there. Well, if we move to the ultimate load values, um, we find a result that is connected with, with Michael explained before in his presentation is that we found a 20% increase in the uh, uh, node strength, the ultimate uh, value, the rupture value of the laminate for the case of the thin thick blocks. So this was initially an unexpected result for us because we assume as is very well known that the, um, uh, the zero, Plies will control the failure, but um, what well, we decided to try to analyze a little bit, which uh, could be the cause for this uh, difference. So, following uh, a quite recent advice from from Michael's and a very inspiring discussion we had, uh, we decided to look at the zero degree plies at uh, level of the load quite close to failure. And I don't know if you can see it well here, but uh, we found that in the zero degree plies, there were many, many fibers broken, but in comparison with the uh, thin blocks, we found that there were fibers broken, of course, but the number 
was uh, less, uh, much lower than in the first case. Um, in addition, if we uh, compare the curves from the uh, test, the load uh, strain curves, we can see here these jumps in the uh, case of the thick blocks. And um, whereas in the case of the thin blocks, we cannot see these jumps. So this, these jumps are also associated to this presence of more damage, in this case, in the zero uh, degree plies. And we can see here a connection. We are, this is an open question, we are studying it, but we can see this uh, um, explanation or just a bit of explanation for this fact. Well, as a summary of the ideas, um, um, we wonder now if, um, I don't know, in agreement with the idea of the workshop, which are the factors affect, affecting the strength in this case of a cross ply laminate. Of course, the number of plies involved, as they were referred, uh, the laminate thickness, we also think, and also, as also Michael said before, the stacking sequence has a, as an important, we don't know to what extent, and also the, it could be important. So we just put it as an open question. Um, we hope for the discussion after the presentations. That's all I wanted to share for now. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Elena. The next speaker, is myself. Um, I will also time myself. Can you stop sharing your screen, Elena? Uh, I can also kick you off, actually. It's even easier. Yes, okay, thank you. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen now. Um, so I will also be talking about the effect of transverse cracking on longitudinal tensile strength from a slightly different angle. Um, so Elena has already shown you the damage development that you expect to find in cross-ply laminate. So if you make this um, 0, 90, 0 laminate, you can talk about the ply thicknesses. Um, and you load this up in the zero degree direction, you will first get transverse cracks, potentially with some delaminations around it. And eventually you'll get fiber breaks and you get complete failure. Um, you can also see this in the microstructure, very similar to what Elena showed. Um, you get a transverse crack and at the tip you get uh, delamination typically if the ply is thin enough. And we've also observed that you, just like Elena, that you actually get more fiber, well, you get fiber breaks near the tip of this transverse crack. And we've also been able to quantify this and show that near these tips, you have a higher density of fiber breaks, at least on the surface. We have not done this analysis in 3D, unfortunately. Now, there is some experimental data um, in the literature as well, and even simulation data summarized here, um, where you can see the, the dark dots, they are simulations. And they're essentially, if you add more 90s, to a cross ply laminate, you don't really see an effect. It's just essentially the same bundle strength. Um, same thing with the experiments. There's more scatter here, but there is no obvious trend that it decreases or increases when you increase the thickness of this 90 degree block. It means if you go towards the left hand side. So we also wanted to check where this is coming from and to see whether we can actually predict whether an effect should be there, whether essentially the stress concentration around these transverse cracks, whether they are large enough to cause extra fiber breaks and to reduce the zero degree strength. So what we do is we essentially model a simple um, setup, cross ply laminate. We only model the two top plies um, because the rest is symmetry if you ignore damage for a second. So the top part is our fiber break model which we've published on extensively, which I'll not explain here. And in the bottom part, we essentially just impose transverse cracking as measured um, experimentally. But then the trick is that we will also try to characterize the, what stress concentrations the transverse cracks will impose onto the zero degree ply. We can do that with finite element models. And here is one example um, where you see a nice butterfly profile. And if you zoom in, you actually see that at the tip of one of these transverse cracks, you get significant um, magnification of the local stresses and strains. Um, 
you can look at this more quantitatively and you see that when you're near one of these two transverse cracks, you get a strain stress con strain or stress concentration factor of about 25%. But this is a very local effect. So this doesn't tell you much. Is that going to reduce the strain or the failure strain of the zero degree ply? For that, you actually need to put that into a model, um, into the fiber break model. And that's what we've done here. So we calculated for a 100% zero degree ply, so no cross ply. This is our reference, 100% failure strain. Um, or not 100% failure strain, but uh, this is our reference. If you then um, run the simulation, you see that when you have the same ply thickness in the 90s, um, you get essentially a 5% reduction just due to this 25% strain concentration that you're creating. And we've also done this with an analytical approach to calculate the strain concentration, essentially get the same result very close to 5% as well. Now, if we add the, some more plies in the middle, we double the thickness, then it's 9%. If you take four times the thickness, then you're at 16, 17%. So this is quite a big drop. And it's a bit in line also with what other people have reported that transverse cracks can actually significantly drop the um, zero degree ply strength. Now, there are still a few open questions. We've not modeled the laminations around the transverse crack tips, and I think that will magnify the effect. And we've also done this only for 90 degree cracks. When you have 45 degree cracks, things change. You have a larger stiffness degradation, um, potentially larger stress concentration, but they will not be concentrated in one cross section like with a 90 degree crack. So I don't know whether that's worse or better. Uh, that would have to be modeled or done experimentally to check whether this is the case or not. And with that, I'm nicely at five minutes, so I will pass on to the next speaker, which is uh, Professor Tomonaga Okabe. We can see your screen. Can I start? Are you yeah. okay? Yes. Uh, go ahead. I would like to talk about this topic. So. So uh, this is animation of unidirectional failure made by Professor Bill Carton. The red line, uh, red, red dash line represents a defect. So uh, it breaks or, or it breaks uh, as the load increase. So at a certain point, so the critical cluster occurs, so leading to the formation, uh, so uh, that this cl cluster propagates like a clock, eventually uh, results in the final failure. So this is a typical uh, process of uh, fa uh, the uh, failure process of a unidirectional composite. So this figure was made more than 20 years ago in collaboration with Blue Cartoon. They are using the numerical simulation. The accumulative damage and uh, uh, formulation of the critical cluster and uh, Final failure are well reproduced, but this type of simulation tends to overestimate the stre tensile strength in many cases. So then, uh, I investigated the reason why simulation overestimates the tensile strength using multiple fiber uh, composite. As you can see, the matrix cracks occur, so it propagates uh, from the fiber breaking point, causing the adjacent fibers to fail. So therefore, I try to experimentally investigate the uh, how much stress concentration occur using double fiber fragmentation test. Uh, uh, here, uh, I'm using the bisphenol, epoxylation and the five different types of uh, five different types of fibers. So we examine the coordinate break percent at the final state of the double fiber fragmentation test. We incorporated the ad hoc local stress concentration into the numerical simulation to estimate the stress concentration factor. You can see that uh, so experimentally the uh, estimate the uh, stress concentration is uh, ranged from the 1.5 to the 2.0. So then, uh, so uh, 
uh, almost two, 200, uh, two, two, 20 years ago, we proposed the spring element model. This is a kind of the one dimensional finite element analysis, uh, but it successfully the linearized the, by incorporating the nonlinear stress recovery as an info internal force to reduce the computational cost. Here, so we incorporated the so obtained stress concentration factor in the spring element model. So then uh, we made the uh, UD uh, CFRP specimen. So uh, using the same uh, bisphenol epoxy resin and the five different fibers, you can see the predicted tensile strength is fairly agree well with the experimental data. So then uh, I, I, I think, so then the, uh, hereafter we, we can uh, so predict the strengths of the unidirectional composite accurately. But, so then the, I would like to move on to the today's top copy, topic. So then let's move on to the composite laminar strengths. This is the main topic of this workshop. So our group is also doing the simulation of the open hole uh, specimen, uh, like, like uh, uh, my, uh, Michael. So then the, uh, so this is a strategy of the modeling of the open hole uh, laminate. So then the, we consider non-linear strain response and the transverse and clock and the delamination, longitudinal tensile failure. So such kind of failure is modeled by the a wide criteria proposed by Harrett and the uh, uh, longitudinal compression failure is modeled with the smeared clock model and the lag criteria. So you can see that the proposed simulation could reproduce the similar damage pattern as experiments. So simulated to, uh, so strengths is uh, 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 simulated strengths agreed well with the experiments. So we are also using the such kind of the viable criteria. We confirm the Hallett, the viable criteria is fairly good, but so in many cases, so this viable modulus is a little bit different from the uh, viable modulus obtained from the spring element model. So then the such kind of difference is quite important to, to understand the uh, how to predict the uh, composite, uh, the strength of the composite laminate. That's, that's my, uh, that's all of my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then we'll move to Christian Hochard. It okay? Yes, we hear you and we see your screen properly. So go ahead. Yeah. I'm going to present you an analysis of the failure modes for quasi isotropic laminates uh, for different materials. Uh, a glass epoxy unbalanced woven ply, a carbon thermoplastic peak balanced woven ply used by Airbus helicopter, and uh, a carbon epoxy UD ply and woven ply, same fiber and same matrix. And uh, the experimental results will be compared to a simulation using a, a UD continuum damage, classical UD continuum damage mechanics uh, in plane stresses and a very simple uh, assumption um, where well, the so woven ply is replaced by two equivalent uh, UD plies. So, for example, for the uni unidirectional carbon epoxy ply, we have here the identification of the model, and uh, the black line is uh, the model, and uh, with transverse damage here, shear damage, and the brittle behavior in the direction of the fibers with uh, maximum stress here. This model works in the case of quasi isotropic laminates. The model works very well 
uh, if the traction is in the direction of the fiber, but it doesn't work as Michael uh, showed uh, before, but doesn't work if the traction is uh, following the uh, bisector. We have here a very big difference because we will see after we have delamination in this case. Uh, here we have the identification of the model for the unbalanced uh, woven ply glass epoxy with uh, shear damage here, transverse damage here, and the greater behavior in the fiber direction with the maximum stress here. In this case, the model works, the in-plane st stresses model works very well for uh, the traction in the fiber direction with the failure of the uh, fiber. And it works correctly in this case when you have a traction along the bisector because we used uh, woven plies which uh, have a better resistance uh, to delamination, uh, which is confirmed with this uh, in this case with a balanced woven ply and a peak resin, which is very resistant to delamination. And in this case, we have uh, even for the um, traction uh, following the bisector, we have a very good simulation and we, we have a fiber failure in the 22 plies. So the model of uh, the ply in plane stresses with uh, maximum stress works in this case because the resistance to delamination for th in this case is very high. Finally, if we study all the, the result for all the materials, we have, first we have the, we studied the unidirectional carbon epoxy ply, which is uh, we if we calculate the edge effect, we can observe a very high a very high level of out, out of plane uh, stresses. And if we uh, observe the transverse strain field during the tension test, we can observe a very heterogeneous uh, strain field just before the failure, which is characteristic of delamination. The same material, carbon and uh, epoxy, uh, but with woven ply, we show a better resistance in to compared to delamination in this case. In the case of uh, sorry, in the case of the glass, if you measure the transverse uh, strain, uh, we can observe uh, just before the failure an homogeneous strain field which can confirm fiber failure. And finally, uh, in the case of the balance carbon uh, fiber with peak resin, this, in this, this case, it's not sensitive to delamination. So finally, in conclusion, I, present, I presented you a very simple test to qualify the resistance to, to delimination of uh, different materials and or to know a limit of plane stress models. Of course, much more easy, easier to use because it's in 2D. If you want to study the delamination, we, we need to do 3D computation. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christian. Now we move on to Xiao Dong Xu. Can you stop sharing, Christian? Uh, yes, I actually take the over. Ah, okay, uh, good, fine as well. <laughs> so, can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Um, I look. I would like to talk about uh, predicting and not strengths. Yeah, let me make it full screen. Predicting and not strengths of quasi-isotropic laminates using UD strengths and the size effect laws. I would like to uh, clarify all test cases in my presentation is under tension. 
So I want to begin with talking about uh, size effect. Uh, size effect can be defined as a change in strength with specimen dimensions. So the early study could be traced by to uh, Leonardo da Vinci. So he studied these uh, uh, ropes of different length. Um, he uh, claimed that the longest rope is the uh, least strong because the longest rope has more uh, links between these material points. And any of these links uh, breaks, the whole system will collapse. So this is what he called a uh, weakest link. And we could use the same concept in um, composites. So the UD composite strength is controlled by defects in the fibers. So they will follow the same uh, weakest link theory. Uh, we often call it Weibull theory. So extensive careful experiments were conducted by Michael and his co-authors. Uh, in this case, they tested UD laminates with different volumes. And you can observe very significant reduction of tensile strength when the volume is scaled up. And in this case, it's up to 14%. So I and Michael, we tested quasi-isotropic laminates at uh, Bristol Composite Institute. So in this case, we only scale the gauge length, we fix the thickness and the width. Uh, effectively, we are also scaling the volume. So what we observe is we find the same scaling trend, which is governed by this Weibull modulus. Uh, it's very similar to the Weibull modulus of the UD strands. And this is not very su um, surprising because the, the failure of the quasi-isotropic laminates, we believe, is controlled by the same defects in the zero-degree plies. In a slightly earlier work um, Michael did with uh, the other co-authors, they also tested quasi-isotropic laminates uh, with the same material, m 7 a 5 2 So what they found was there were edge delamination close to the antaps. And because of these edge delamination, the specimens failed prematurely. And because of the premature failure, um, we couldn't relate these uh, quasi astrophic strands to the UD strands, uh, because in the UD laminates, there is no such edge failure mechanism. So we slightly improved our test in a later work. Uh, what we did was to remove all antaps because what we think uh, what could contribute to the uh, premature failure is the extra stress concentration near the antaps. Without these antaps, uh, we slightly increase the uh, quasi astrophic strength, and we can relate the quasi astrophic strength to the UD strength and the tension. And the uh, relationship was established through the volume of the zero degree material in these quasi-astropic uh, laminates. Uh, so we compared the predicted uh, uh, strengths of these uh, quasi-astropic laminates to the experiments. Uh, the error is within 1.5%. So we think it's quite satisfactory. So if you are interested in our work, you could find more details in our paper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chao Dong. Our, our next speaker is Richard Butler. Good afternoon, um, everybody. Hopefully you can see my slides. So I, I wanna talk about how um, edge delaminations um, might affect coupon strength. So uh, about seven or eight years ago, we got involved with some testing work for GKN where we were looking at the corner and folding strength of uh, laminated material. Um, and we discovered that by putting on a, a resin edge along the edge of the corner, uh, we improved the strength. So experimentally, we improved the strength by of order of uh, 16%. If we look at the numerical results, the finite element results, we see what's happening. We can 
reduce the stress concentration at the edge, which occurs due to the a bending induced uh, effect. And uh, by putting a, a resin with modulus, for instance, eight and a half gigapascals, we, we almost uh, eliminate that edge effect. So what I want to do now is just explain how we've uh, applied that to tensile strength uh, with a notch, with a open hole. Um, so first of all, um, we're gonna need to use finite element method to, to model these edge effects. Um, but in order to validate the finite element model, we compared it with some test results, which we, which we looked at both in the literature and our own test results on standard angle laminates and non-standard angle laminates. And here, the standard angle laminates were sort of uh, 50, 40, 10 of naught plus minus 45, 90. And it would, we had a plus minus 10, 57 non-standard angle, which matched the stiffness of the standard angle laminate. And you can see we got pretty good agreement in terms of different numbers of ply blocks and different uh, stand, non-standard angles. The 10 degrees here is, is a misalignment, which Michael referred to earlier in, in the tensile load. So what's the effect of edge treatment on these tensile strengths? Well, um, in this slide, I basically compare the strength of different standard angle laminates with different numbers of naught degree uh, blocked plies. Um, again, it's this 50, 40, 10 laminate, so the standard, that, that laminate. We're, we're just using the finite element results here because we've already validated those. And we can see that um, when we don't have any misalignment, we get much better strength in the open hole case uh, for, for a blocked, more blocked plies. But as soon as we increase misalignment, we have a 10 degree misalignment of load, that strength is reduced significantly. However, if we put a, a layer of edge treatment, this is numerical edge treatment now, so it's one millimeter of ideal material that doesn't break, but has the same stiffness as the laminate we recover a great deal of that strength. It's interesting to note that the non-standard angle laminates, because the shear delamination case occurs uh, naturally, is not affected either by the misalignment or the edge treatment significantly. So we see that edge treatment enables the strength levels to approach the UD strength. Uh, this is approaching the UD strength of the material that the uh, misalignment reduces the strength and that we can recover that. So in conclusion, um, I would say edge treatment increases coupon strength. We've done it in um, corner bend tests. We've also done it in short beam shear tests where we saw up to 36% improvement. But uh, in terms of open hole tension with the model, it was a 50% improvement. Um, so my observation is that coupon tests can be flawed when assessing wide part strength because of this edge delamination. And that in order to get a realistic assessment, we need to, to investigate the in situ strength of, of, uh, of the material. And we're, as part of a program grant with Bristol, Southampton and Exeter universities in the UK, Funded by the UKRI, um, we have SIRTEST, which is exploring this, uh, this um, increase in length scale on, and the effects on structural performance um, applied to structural parts. Thank you, that completes my presentation. Thank you, Richard. Next speaker is Sylvester Pino. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Jentel. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So we've seen in uh, pretty much all of the talks so far the, the implications of subcritical damage 
uh, for the longitudinal failure or the fiber dominated failure of multidirectional laminates. And that's a problem because typically the subcritical damage makes the strength of multidirectional laminates be lower than what we expect, but also because it's actually difficult to predict in great detail uh, why uh, that is the case and exactly how that subcritical damage evolves. So what I want to do in this talk is to actually uh, show uh, precisely what some of those difficulties are. And I'll start with something very, uh, very simple, which is a, a transverse crack, for instance, in a 90 degree ply, reaching a zero degree ply and initiating a delamination. So experimentally, what we have here, if you have a zero 090 zero laminate and you increase the load that you apply, you know what you expect to happen. At some point, you'll have a 90 degree ply failure, then more 90 degree ply failures. And as you increase the load, the laminations will grow. And this is something which may seem relatively simple, but is actually quite difficult to simulate properly numerically. And I want to show why. So if we focus on just the upper half of this drawing to make use of symmetry, this is now not the actual ply, but a numerical model of the ply. And if you look at uh, this element here, suppose that it has already failed, so we are simulating an anti-degree ply. It could be using, for instance, XFEM or the phantom node method. Then what we need to happen at some point is for us to have a delamination here, which could hopefully be simulated with this cohesive element. But what happens in reality is that if you plot the displacement jump between these two interfaces, here at the left, you'll have a certain value, which we can call negative. Here at this side, you'll have a certain value, which you can call positive. In the middle, you'll have an interpolating function, the shape function of the element interpolating. And if you have, for instance, just one integration point in this element, this cohesive element will never see uh, the fact that it should eventually be starting to delaminate because this effect and this one effectively cancel at the center. If you have more than one integration point, it will fail at some point, but clearly at a much delayed uh, moment. So ideally what you would like to have is that when this uh, element fails, that the cohesive element itself splits in two so that you actually don't lose that concentration. So in that case, you'd have still the same displacement jump at one end and at the other, but now you'll have a bigger jump at the end, which allows you to simulate this transition to the elimination, which is key to capture if the delamination is itself then important for the fa final failure of the laminate. So if I just show you uh, two cases, one in which we split the element and one we, we don't on a simple 0-90 uh, laminate. So this is an approach where we have the 90 degree layer at the bottom, the zero at the top uh, modeled with very standard methods. So phantom node method for the 90 degree ply and standard cohesive elements for the interface. And here where we split the elements at the bottom. So if I just zoom in, and load this intention, you can see the failed integration points in red. You can see that if we split the cohesive elements at the interface, we get the elimination starting sooner. And if you look in detail, when we don't split the cohesive elements, actually the first integration points to fail are not even the ones that are directly closer to this 90 degree crack. And this is why the eliminations are significantly less formed in that case than in the one in the bottom. So one thing we've done was to uh, code elements that could be able to deal uh, with that. So this is a three-dimensional ply element, which models a ply that can fail with cracks uh, in any possible orientation with respect uh, to the mesh to simulate the 90 degree cracks. We simulate, we created cohesive elements that can themselves split. So for instance, the cohesive element can separate to simulate the lamination, but it can also split here to, to reflect a 90 degree crack from the ply above and the bottom surface can also split to reflect a, a 90 degree crack from the ply below. And with that, what we did was to join different ply elements with the cohesive elements and build effectively generic laminate elements, which allow us with a very simple two-dimensional mesh actually simulate everything that happens in the uh, thickness and have continuity of those cracks and simulate interactions between matrix cracks and eliminations properly. So with that, I wanted to jump to a simulation of a test that uh, Michael showed earlier. So this is a quasi isotropic laminate with four uh, plies blocked together for each ply block. Uh, what uh, Michael observed in these tests uh, quite long ago was that you had these uh, 45 degree uh, cracks 
and then you would have these uh, delaminations growing uh, at these places. And then eventually at final failure or before final failure, the uh, specimen had fully uh, delaminated. And so uh, in this case, the strength was much lower than what you'd expect just from lamination theory. And uh, it's um, definitely a case in which all the subcritical damage affected the strength of the laminate significantly. So these are simulations here now where we model uh, these effects with through the thickness displacement uh, uh, quite accurately. This is uh, at early stages of the simulation where you have all these edge uh, cracks not growing completely yet in the 90 degrees. You have some cracks in the 45s. You have some delamination between the 45s and the 90s at these places where you have those cracks. And if I move forward in time, you get more of those cracks, you get the lamination to grow in a way that you can see that you can map with this higher density of cracks. And at the end, uh, you have a very large density of uh, cracks and full delamination. And this is when eventually uh, fiber failure happens. And so in this model, with uh, clearly a very significant number of cracks simulated individually, the interaction between those cracks and the lamination in each element is modeled as well as it can hopefully uh, be. And that's all from me. Thank you, Sylvester. Then we move to Joel. Yeah, so, okay. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, in this, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. So in this uh, presentation, I would like to talk about the whether the, the, the ultimate strength of quasi-isotropic fin ply laminate is controlled by fiber failure or by other mechanisms. So it's a, it's a summary uh, from many different research that uh, I did at EPFL uh, in the past and also the work of uh, Guillaume Brogy and uh, Veronique Michaud, my colleagues. Um, so in the, I, I will start with a small story actually. Um, so it's, it's related to the PhD thesis of Guillaume Brody, who just finished. Uh, he was studying the hybrid fin ply composites with a uh, uh, I-strain fiber with the 34700, which is more or less like a T700 fiber if, that you, you probably all know. Uh, it has an ultimate strain, a strain of 2%. Uh, and this fiber was combined with HR40 in different arrangement um, as, as, the, as an higher modulus fiber for creating an hybrid. So all this study was using uh, fin ply composites from NTPT uh, with plies of uh, 60 microns for the 34700 and uh, 30 microns for the HR40. So these are really fin plies. And um, overall, the uh, we, we are using an highly toughened system. Yeah. So we did uh, many uh, quasi-isotropic tests uh, with acoustic uh, emission monitoring to see uh, what we get. And uh, the inter interesting bit is actually uh, we didn't absorb pseudoductility at first. Um, this was uh, hopefully not uh, due to, uh, to a problem with the, the theory uh, about pseudoductile uh, laminates, but uh, it was really related to, uh, to a problem with the assumptions we used for designing the material. Indeed, we were expecting uh, a ultimate uh, failure of the 34700 uh, plies uh, at about 2%, which is the ultimate failure of, of the fiber. And uh, what we, we could only uh, observe is about 1.6%, uh, uh, even for the very thin ply at 60 gram per, per square meter. Uh, what was notable is that uh, we didn't observe delamination or, or not, uh, noticeable transverse cracking before failure, and the failure was quasi brittle. So it looked really like a fiber fail. So that was really surprising because in our past research, uh, when we studied many different systems, uh, like here for T700, uh, T800 fibers here, um, we could see that uh, with highly toughened systems, we could reach a ultimate strain for the quasi-isotropic that was actually matching the, the strain uh, of the, the UD ply. Um, and this, this was uh, verified for several systems here. And uh, if we look at uh, the system in question, uh, compared to the theoretical limit we could reach, here we could only reach um, about 80% of this value. 
And more noticeable is uh, that the scaling uh, by reducing the ply thickness from uh, 180 to uh, six, uh, 60 uh, micron was not really there. Uh, what was actually interesting is that we noticed that in the past, we already had observed a system that didn't scale also. Uh, it was a system with a standard uh, 180 degree C epoxy, which was untoughened and very brittle. And uh, the TP415 system here is actually the exact opposite. It's very tough. It has a lot of uh, toughening rubber um, in it, but it didn't show any scaling as well, or noticeable scaling. So we looked at uh, our data and uh, actually looking at the data from NTPT, uh, the supply of the material uh, for T800 uh, fibers and quasi-isotropic ten uh, testing, we could observe that they also uh, got the same kind of uh, dependency of the ultimate strain uh, of the quasi-iso depending on, on the matrix used. So this was really surprising. And uh, so we looked in detail um, to the to the fracture surface, we didn't observe much, uh, except these uh, clusters here that you observe between the fibers and uh, in the matrix. These look really like um, the nanoparticles used for toughening, uh, the rubber particles. And um, this asks the question, I mean, the, the, the question uh, that we get is whether these uh, tougheners are actually sites for nucleation for, um, uh, uh, for cavitation in the matrix. Uh, indeed, in the in the past, we also done some simulation for micromechanics of fin ply composites or transverse cracking in the PGTs of Sebastian Kohler, and we observed that uh, in this simulation that we, if you look at the uh, uh, pressure versus von Mises stress in the matrix, we are mostly in the biaxial tension between biaxial tension and triaxial loading in the matrix, and thus the behavior of, for transverse cracking must be very dependent on the cavitation limits that we have for, for the matrix here. So another option is also the decohesion between the fiber uh, and the matrix. But for sure, we cannot really rule out that the, the matrix is, a, is an important aspect, uh, even in very thin ply composites. It can, with optimized resins, we can reach the ultimate strain of the fibers. However, in, in other resins, uh, we could have a much lower ultimate strain for the quasi-isotropic. And um, this leads to the observation that maybe there is an optimal resin for thick plies, which is an eye toughness resin, and maybe a, a, another resin for very thin ply where you need the eye cavitation limit. So that's all for me. Thank, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Joel. Um, then we move to Dan Adams. How is that? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, today I'll be presenting on work that was performed back in the 1990s and 2000s, um, primarily by my father, Don Adams, uh, and his graduate students at the University of Wyoming um, when they were developing the uh, combined loading compression test method. And uh, some of you may have heard that uh, Don passed away just before the holidays. And uh, so I'll make this brief presentation in honor of my father. So the combined loading compression test method was developed for the purpose of testing multi-directional composite laminates, primarily cross-ply and, and uh, quasi-isotropic and using backout factors uh, to obtain the zero degree compression strength. As I mentioned, it was developed at the University of Wyoming. Uh, it was standardized by ASTM back in 2001, interestingly for using uh, untabbed specimens and uh, with the idea of um, testing cross-ply laminates. In 2009, the standard was revised and uh, it was, um, uh, it included uh, tab specimens with the idea of using unidirectional laminates. And uh, so in general, this test method then can be used for unidirectional as well as multidirectional laminates with the idea that you um, 
apply both end and shear loading, and in general, just enough shear loading to present, uh, excuse me, prevent the ends from failing. So the whole idea here is to, um, when you test multi-directional laminates, um, is to uh, reduce the amount of total force that's required to fail the specimen, and most importantly, to allow the use of untabbed specimens. Makes for uh, compression testing that's a lot simpler and oftentimes more successful. Um, but the use of multi-directional laminates then requires the use of this back, back out factor um, to get the unidirectional strength. And to this day, uh, that has not been approved by ASTM for use in uh, compression test methods. So this back out factor um, is not that controversial in the sense that it's basically just using laminated plate theory. And uh, looking at the uh, stress in the zero degree ply within a cross ply or a quasi isotropic laminate. And so at the center of the slide here is the uh, expression for the back out factor. You can see it's in terms of the elastic properties of the composite. And uh, in general, the back out factor then increases as the modulus, the axial modulus of the laminate decreases. So for example, it's one for a unidirectional laminate, about 1.8 for a cross ply, about 2.5 for quasi isotropic. And at the uh, bottom of the screen in the red, you can see the back out factor expressed in terms of uh, uh, laminated plate theory, but from laminated plate theory, uh, but for a general balanced and symmetric laminate. What I wanted to focus on here in the next minute or two is uh, the data that was collected um, back in the time when this composite, when this uh, combined loading compression test was being developed and standardized. And uh, this is back from in the 1990s and start of the 2000s. But what's interesting is that back then there was a lot less variety of uh, composite material systems. Uh, and uh, carbon epoxies. And so all this data is from a single system, AS43501-6 carbon epoxy, from lots of different laboratories. And the idea here is it's plotted with the, uh, 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 the, the axial modulus of the laminate on the horizontal axis. And so the data that you see way over on the right-hand side is data from unidirectional composite laminates. The blue line towards the middle is from cross ply laminates. Data generally along this red line is from quasi isotropic. And then the data further to the left is from other laminates, special laminates as we would uh, refer to them here. And on either side, the left or the right is the backed out um, zero degree compressive strength. So this is a collection of data, as I say, from lots of different test laboratories. So there's quite a bit of scatter, um, perhaps due to a variety of different reasons. But uh, as you look across these three types of laminates with the, uh, the red, the blue, and the gray line, uh, you can see that in general, the backed out zero degree compressive strength uh, is very similar between them. And of course, lots of scatter, and that can be due to difficulty in performing tests as well as um, just different laboratories. Interestingly, these other laminates called special laminates here that have a lower modulus, these are uh, attempts to back out the zero degree uh, strength using laminates that are softer than quasi isotropic, which is basically um, testing the laminate in the uh, more compliant direction in which there's fewer zero degree layers. And back when this uh, was being developed, the general idea was that the constraint effect on the zero degree plies uh, was different. And in fact, that in these special laminates that there was uh, additional constraint against uh, fiber microbuckling. And so um, in general, this historical data does suggest that the uh, backed out strength from cross ply and quasi isotropic laminates is comparable to the unidirectional laminate strength. And uh, the back off factors, though, have not been approved to, uh, to date for use in any of the ASTM standards. And uh, the composite materials handbook, uh, however, does present the uh, back out factors, and it's been used in some NCAMP data. 
Um, but I'll leave you with the, uh, the final point, and that is that uh, testing of cross-ply in quasi-isotropic laminates appears to be much easier for most people than uh, with unidirectional laminates. So that's all I have. Thank you, Dan. Um, we have two more presentations left. First, uh, starting with Frédéric. Yeah. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. So, I'm very happy to present you the work performed at Onera dealing with the estimation of the compressive failure on multidirectional laminates. So, just a few words uh, about the, the physical mechanism, which is observed when you perform uh, on a UD ply a longitudinal compressive test. You are going to observe fiber kinking, as you can see here. Um, which is due to the instability of carbon fiber embedded in a polymer matrix that you can observe at the microscopic scale. Finally, at that scale, it is a structural effect. And this is the reason why in the different micromechanical approaches that you can find in the literature, they depend on obviously the mechanical property of fiber and matrix, but also on the applied loading and the associated boundary condition, which play a major role on the prediction of the instability of carbon fiber. Therefore, you would like to use that scale to predict accurately the, the fiber kinking, but at the same time, you would like also to answer to the industrial need and to simulate large composite structure. This is the reason why a mesoscale approach seems to be a good trade-off between complexity of the modeling, capacity, uh, predictive capability, and the uh, complexity of the identification. This is the reason why we have proposed um, a mesoscale approach in which we try to predict the final failure of a laminate knowing the mechanical property at the ply scale. But for compression, it is necessary to uh, be able to update the um, value of the strengths that you, are, yeah, that you are going to use into your mesoscale approach. And you are going to update that thanks to the use of a micro-mechanical approach uh, that takes into account the different parameters that I have presented previously. Therefore, in the next two slides, I'm going to present you the mesoscale strategy and then the microscale strategy to predict finally the final failure of a laminate subjected to compression or bending. So for the mesoscopic approach, we use the Onera failure approach developed since many years at Onera to um, predict the failure of different carbon epoxy material among which the T700M21, as you can see here. I don't want to describe all the model, but just put the stress on the uh, key points uh, that you have to address to predict accurately the final failure due to compressive loading. You have to take into account the elastic nonlinearity that uh, in the fiber direction that you can observe both for tension and compression loading. And also you have to describe the elastic nonlinearity that you uh, can observe for uh, in-plane shear loading, and we perform that thanks to a viscoelastic behavior. We recently, as performed, have applied the same approach for a carbon fiber associated with a thermoplastic material, the TC1225 materials, and we are able also to predict that rather accurately from the ply um, scale to the macroscopic scale. But to predict the compression, we need to update the strength at the ply scale thanks to the use of a micro-mechanical approach. For that, we consider the model developed by Drapier and Grandidier, uh, which uh, who has proposed an engineering um, equation that you can split into two parts, one dedicated to the microbuckling mechanism and one dedicated to the structural effect, which is the, the major part. In fact, in this equation, the key point is the thickness of the ply which, in which you are really obtain uh, fiber buckling. And this thickness is going to depend on the applied loading. As you can see, it is different if you apply compression or bending, and it is different if you consider also different position of the zero degree ply in the stacking sequences, especially if it is the zero degree ply are inner or outer plies. So in the next two slides, I'm going to present you the prediction of the model and comparison with experimental data. So for the carbon epoxy materials, we have first identified the micro-mechanical approach thanks to a uniaxial tensile test on the plus or minus 45 degree and also on a compression test as you, have, as you have seen previously. But here we have used a specific tensile test which failed in compression for um, uh, particular stacking sequences due to block pressure effect. 
we have calibrated the model for these two configuration and try to predict the evolution of the unidirectional ply strength if you apply a bending loading on a pure zero degree ply to constitute it with 60 plies or 32 plies. And as you can see, the micro model is able to predict the increase of the apparent strength of the UD ply as a function of the loading. So my point is just to say, if you consider that at micro scale, you can predict the influence of the loading. For the influence of the zero degree ply position through the thickness, for the carbon thermoplastic material, we have considered two stacking sequences, a cross ply laminate and a quasi isotropic laminate. And you can see both from an experimental point of view and numerical point of view that you have a large discrepancy between the two configurations, especially considering the strain at failure. This is due to the fact that for the quasi isotropic laminate, the failure is due to the kinking in the inner zero degree ply. And for the cross ply laminate, it is due to the kinking in the outer zero degree ply, which is well captured by the micro mechanical approach. So to go further, we would like to perform very soon different bending loadings on that material to generate a large databases and try to validate the micro meso approach that we have developed. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Frederic. And then we go into our last presenter, Costa Sitis. Thank you very much. And I hope that you can see my screen. Yes, go ahead. And you can hear me. Thank yeah. you. Uh, the talk is on uh, compression and um, damage modes or failure modes observed uh, when we test uh, carbofiber in uniaxial of compression. If we look at uh, earlier systems, oh, the dominant mode was a shear mode failure uh, because of the stiffer resins used and this was nicely demonstrated uh, by keeping the same resin system, but testing the specimens at um, higher temperatures. And for this system, we can see that at about 100 degrees Celsius, the mechanism transitions from shear mode failure to fiber microbacillin. And then, uh, the triangle points uh, are for newer systems like the T809 to 4C carbofiber epoxy, where the dominant damage mode is the fiber microbacillin at room temperature. And uh, if you go to higher temperatures, the mode remains fiber microbacillin, but it becomes kind of out of plane which happens at lower applied loads. And to really switch back to shear mode of failure, you have to test um, at minus 40 Celsius, minus 50 Celsius. So as you can see for modern carbofiber epoxy systems, the dominant uh, damage mode is fiber microbacillin, which is a fiber instability damage mode. And the same uh, uh, critical damage mode is fiber microbacillin you know, occurs in uh, all multidirectional laminates, where the fiber kinking of the zero plies, uh, accompanied by matrix cracking and delamination, leads to ultimate, ultimate fracture of the, of the plate. So this is a fiber instability mode, and uh, this is how we model it, uh, where the fiber is simulated, is modeled as a Timoshenko beam on a nonlinear foundation. 
and we do take into account uh, the constraining effect uh, of the OFAC splice. And we try to investigate what is the effect uh, or if there is any effect of this OFAC splice on the stability of the zero layers. So this is the equilibrium equation that you have to solve uh, in order to determine the initiation uh, of this fiber instability damage mode in the zero ply, taking into account, as you can see, the properties of the fiber modulus, fiber volume fraction, um, uh, second moment of area, i.e. fiber diameter. Of course, the nonlinear response um, of, the, of the resin in terms of the shear modulus, where the shear modulus varies with the applied load. And um, of course, you have to determine the interlaminar shear stresses at the free edge. And here in the equilibrium equation, we just um, simplify and we kept the tau ZY element stress component, which appears to further destabilize originally, originally already wave fibers. So these, um, once you solve this non-linear differential equation, it gives you the, the compressive stress in the zero ply at which fiber microbuckling will be triggered. Of course, as you can take into account also, as we say, the initial fiber waveness. And of course, with all the models, uh, the question is, are you going to have, are you going to take to assume the average value, the maximum value of this initial waveness? Or better, the model actually allows you to bring in the stochastic aspect and you can have the distribution of fiber waveness. So the microbuckling model accounts for the fiber properties, initial fiber waveness, ply orientation, interlaminar stresses, and matrix nonlinearity. And here we can see uh, we calculate uh, the interlaminar normal and shear stress at the near the free edge. And we can see for this specific uh, layup, plus theta minus theta zero two two symmetric, the middle plane uh, sigma zz is compressive, which is a good thing. You don't you don't want eliminations in your structure when it's loaded in compression because it triggers microbuckling much earlier. And we can see that uh, shear stress components are almost zero around. Theta equals 60 degrees. Can you gradually wrap up? We are running out of time, Costas. Okay, so here you uh, run the model and you find out that the most critical parameter is the fiber waveness and the matrix nonlinearity, while the interlaminar shear stresses are less important, but this might not be the case under fatigue loading. And once you have determined uh, the critical stress of microbuckling initiation, you can predict uh, the strength of your multidirectional laminate with different models, with different approaches, or in this case, a very simplified stiffness ratio method, which you can see the theoretical predictions are pretty conservative. So the static compressive strength of modern UD and MD carbon fiber box laminates is controlled by fiber microbuckling. It initiates by elastic bending the zero fibers. Its initiation depends on material imperfections, such as resin rich regions, voids, and fiber misalignment. And the model shows in the laminar shear stresses has less influence. But that might not be the case for fatigue. When you look at the measured data for all these uh, uh, plus theta, plus minus theta orientations, the strain at failures between 0.88, 0.9%, 1%. Experiments show that specimens with plus minus 45 service plies appear to provide the most resistance to fiber microbuckling. The zero ply stress in such laminate is 1300 megapascals, about 10% less than measured for the 100% zero laminate. But that can be due to blocked plies in the middle of the laminate we have all those zeros blocked together 
fabrication of defects from origin rich regions, voids at the interface of the actual and of access supplies. Thank you. Thank you, Costas. Um, this also concludes our 11 five minute presentations. Most authors um, were quite close to this five minutes, so thank you for keeping on time. Um, we now have about 15 minutes left for first a discussion among the panel members, so I will ask all of them to turn on their cameras now. Um, we will then also pick up questions from the audience um, after the break, which will start in about 15 minutes. Um, so the audience members can already type in questions so that they are waiting for the period after the break when we can address them. So anybody on the panel who wants to start the discussion? Let me start with a question for Dan. You've got a lot of data, Dan, on compression, and I'm wondering whether you've noticed any effects on stacking sequence, uh, and particularly about where, where the zero plies are on the surface compared to the interior, as we've heard uh, mentioned in some of the other presentations. Yeah, that's a good question. I must admit that I did not go back and uh, scour the data closely enough to, to be able to answer that question. Um, I believe that uh, in general, the cross-ply laminates, the, the uh, zeros were fairly dispersed with 90 degrees on the outside. Same with the quasi-isotropic. So I, I would say that uh, the, the idea was to test uh, engineering laminates, if you will, following all the best practices associated with ply layups in, in application. So I think they were fairly dispersed zeros as opposed to uh, larger blocks in general. Hello. Federico. Thank you very much to all of you for your contributions. And I have uh, more than a question is a comment about modeling uh, transverse damage, transverse crack, and delamination. Uh, because uh, me, I have been teaching this uh, matter, saying, as you have uh, shown, first I have a transverse crack, and then apply more loading, I may have delamination. But this is not uh, true in the sense that it does not cover all the possibilities you can find. If you have a very thick uh, 90 degrees uh, ply, then instantaneously you get, from an experimental point of view, you get immediately the to total transverse clock plus the lamination. Now, if you move to the opposite side, to, the, to very thin uh, laminas, you may have no transverse crack till total rupture. You may have uh, isolated debondings, but not delamination, or even you may have signs of delamination, but no connection with the um, uh, transverse damage. Now, if we go to an intermediate uh, thickness of the 90 degrees, when you have the, the transverse damage, and here you have the interface with the other, due to a Gordon effect, this crack will stop and will stop uh, having damage uh, consisting on connected debonding in between the, the two interfaces. The matter is that depending of our um, interest in the analysis, one typical model having one only one transverse crack or having transverse crack plus delamination may be or not representative of what uh, we have in mind to predict with the model, uh, with the numerical model. I have learned more of the, most of this when I uh, have been using ultra thin pliers, checking the damage, and also thin thin pliers as Airbus want to use, uh, checking also the incidence of this damage into the behavior of the total laminate. It was just a comment, but I remember to have seen one model by uh, uh, Gentle and another by um, uh, Silvestre that are connected with this uh, generic comment. Anybody wants to respond to that? It was not yeah. a question, but maybe uh, maybe uh, a few few points to add. 
Um, so in the, in in the our previous work from uh, Sebastian Kohler, we, so we did the uh, modeling of transverse cracking at the micro scale, and um, it, it relates really closely to what you observe. So so progressive debonding of it isolated fibers for very thin plies, uh, and, and and for intermediate plies where you have. Uh, um, coalescence of this debonding towards a transverse crack that is not always going through the, the full uh, thickness. Um, and for thick ply, very early uh, transverse cracking. We didn't have a sufficiently detailed model for capturing the transition for, from transverse cracking to, to delamination at the micro scale. But I, I think uh, there are many explanations at the micro scale. Um, and uh, this is probably uh, uh, where we should uh, maybe uh, put, put a bit more emphasis, uh, in my opinion. And an interesting aspect also was that um, after the fiber matrix debonding, there were all these ligaments of resin, and they, they behave like bridging bundles. Um, and uh, so I can maybe show you uh, uh, this. Uh, they 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 tend to behave as okay. Does it work? Yes, seems to work. They tend to be as bridging bundles, and okay, that that's where the, the simulation gets into trouble because this is, these are really large strains that we have in these bundles. So we don't know exactly how the matrix behave physically in this area. But there is a for very small crack opening here. We cannot break the bundles actually uh, due, due to the matrix ductility. At least that's what the simulation shows. So, so I think uh, many of these effects of transverse cracking are related to the crack opening uh, that we have here, and if we break the bundles or not. At least on the micro scale, it's a, it's one of the important aspects. Yeah. Any any follow ups on that? Yeah, that's what, if, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Joel, I think you were saying something about um, the toughness of the resin affecting the ply thickness. Yeah. And um, I just wonder if you could elaborate. Um, do you think, what's the mechanism that's driving that? Yeah, the, uh, let me go back to the same. <laughs> It's in screen then, sorry. Yes. Yeah, um, no, no, it's, it's good. Um, yeah, it was a bit short to elaborate on this. So in terms of the mechanisms uh, leading to, to, to transverse cracking, um, we have a fiber matrix debonding. We have plasticity in the resin that you see uh, here, uh, typically in the closed packed region. And and then uh, degradation of the matrix. So these 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 three elements are related to the matrix formulation. Uh, so uh, the adhesion with the fiber can be different between different uh, resins and sizing of the fibers. Um, the, the the ductility is is actually a fairly complicated uh, behavior. Because uh, as as I, I mentioned, it is depending on on the triaxiality. Uh, this is a Drucker Prager model, so it is pressure dependent. And when when we are between fi fibers, we are really in the region where um, we mostly have a triaxial uh, stress state. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to get material properties in this region for resins. So. There is definitely an effect of toughness of the resin, but at some at, at some state, uh, depending on how you toughen the material, for example, here with rubber toughening, you might create initial voids or initial nucleation site for 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 uh, uh, cavitation around uh, these these uh, toughness and. Um, the typical use of these tougheners is for thick plies to improve the delamination resistance and so on. But for thin plies, it might be a problem because we mold the resin because it, we go to a much larger strain. Um, 
de develops a lot of plasticity and, and works really in the triaxial state. So that, that's an hypothesis, but I think the, um, what we observed is that uh, the scaling is uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, life thickness effect is, is always somehow there, but the magnitude of the scaling is very dependent on the resin. Okay. Joelle, a follow-up question on that. You say that this TP415 resin, that it's a toughened resin. Does this yeah. mean it actually has a high mode one or mode two fracture toughness? Um, it has a, oh, I forgot the data, but it has a fairly high toughness, yes, compared to to um, to some other system that they, they have at NTPT. They, they don't have the, the, the toughest resin, uh, overall, uh, but um, it is still a relatively uh, highly toughened resin. It's a 135 degree curing system, so it, it's um, it it is a rubber toughened system. So this fact that the rubber particles are agglomerated had effects mm. on the very small scale, but not not decreasing the interlaminar fracture toughness below the values you would expect for a rubber toughened system. Then. Yeah, I, I still think it is it is effective as a toughener in terms of bulk uh, in delamination, um, typically where 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 the crack is going uh, mostly in the matrix, but uh, but it can also affect uh, the property in, uh, in in transverse cracking. I think that's that, that's where it's it's like like a reduced ductility of the resin in, when it is behaving in the, in the, in a triaxial loading. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Maybe we first go into the break. Maybe one more from the panel. Yeah, Frederic. Yes, thank you. Uh, just a, a question. Um, in your presentation and in the, the first one performed by Elena, um, we, we have seen um, that depending on the thickness of the ply, uh, you are going to change the onset of scracks. But my question is about in the width direction. What we have observed experimentally in our case for thin ply, the cracks remain confined close to the edge. And when you have thick ply, it goes through the entire width. And we have also observed that the delamination associated at the tip of the cracks remain most of the time confined. And I'm wondering if you have already tried to, to observe that. And we, we have seen nice things in, in the simulation presented by Sylvester Pino on that, where we see the cracks starting from the edge and remain confined in some cases and going through in another one. Um, I'm wondering if you have tried to go further from an experimental point of view, uh, using, for instance, X-ray tomography to see how the cracks uh, propagate through the width. So we have not done that here at K11, but I've seen several people actually showing this. One of them is Joel's group. I think also in the framework of Guillaume Broggi's thesis or one of your previous PhD students. So this has definitely been reported by other people. Yeah, the work of Sebastian Kohler, um, uh, he, he did study this uh, and it could relate the onset of damage from acoustic emission to the growth of the cracks uh, in the width direction from the free edge to the width, to, to, the, to, the, to the bulk of the material. But therefore, to make the link between the failure and the cracks, it's not just with the edge observation, it's very difficult because you don't know the, the effect of the cracks and the loading report on the zero degree ply around. So mm. to capture no, that from a modeling point of view, it's not trivial. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely not. I think Elena also wants to respond. Yes, thank you. Uh, we did not observe that. I mean, uh, unfortunately, we, we only have uh, the capacity until now to look at the edge, but uh, we assume, I perfectly understand your point and I, and I I mean, I share with you the idea and, and we are trying to look at it. We assume that at the point we see the, the laminations, we think they're going through the width because they're not uh, something premature, it's not something unusual, it's not initial. It, we start to see the lamination when we uh, know they're going to appear. I mean, first transverse cracks, then the, the laminations, they grow the laminations, so we are assuming that they're going through the width also and then the fibre break is. So I think they are through it with, but we haven't seen them yet. Is that an important point? Yes. 
Okay, um, I would propose that we give everybody a short break here, that we resume uh, at 10 to 4 UK time, 10 to 5 Brussels time. Um, and so everybody has eight or nine minutes for a short break, get a coffee, go to the restroom, and then we'll return. We, yes, we, uh, we will ask the question again, or no? Is it okay? No, I, I was asking about the difference between the 22.5 and the zero carbon peak, which is quite a big difference, and the, the reasons for that. So the first reason, it is uh, woven ply. We, in the past, we measured that woven ply at, are much more resistant to the lamination than UD plies, first reason. And second reason is a peak. Peak is very uh, resistant to the lamination, uh, compared to uh, epoxy. So, so so what was the zero then? Uh, uh, maybe I misunderstood. I thought they were both peak. The zero was not a peak. It's a zero degree. Maybe you can show your slides again, Christina. Yes. That could help to clarify this. So where is my... Uh... Yeah. And we don't have many questions in the Q&A, so if other people have questions they'd like to ask, please put them in the Q&A. Yes. So, um, here we have uh, the behavior with epoxy, and uh, as you've shown, yeah. the traction in the zero degree uh, works, but in the uh, 22 degrees it doesn't work, you have delamination. And here we speak, we have, it works, of course, with zero degree. The, the, we, have this, the, we have exactly the same value uh, in the zero degree. We have fiber failure in the zero degree ply here. But we have, it works for the uh, traction along, along the bisector. In the, and we have uh, fa fiber failure in the 22 degrees. So it works with the in plane stresses uh, model. We, 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 so, so we have uh, a, only in this case, you, you see, we speak, we have a better behavior when, when we have uh, traction in the, this direction. So I still don't understand why the blue one is higher than the red one. The, the, the blue one yeah. is a test experiment. Oh, it's a 0 45, not a. Uh... Okay. Sorry? No, I'm still not quite sure of the difference. Is it because, uh, so this is not an orthogonal, it's a 0 45. Right, so it actually wouldn't expect them to be the same. Sorry, I, okay. I ah, think I've no, 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 it's a quasi isotopic because it is a woman's it is. Line. Right, so, uh, so then I still don't understand why is the blue one higher than the red? The red is traction in zero degree duration. Okay. And the blue is traction along the bisector. So, yeah. I think to summarize it, probably because the fact that in, instead of loading a zero and a 45, if you load one a little bit further up and one a little bit closer to the tensile direction, one is just more important than the other. The fact that one gets closer to the fiber direct to the tensile direction is more important than the one that gets further away from the tensile direction. Yes, here we have the one test, one uh, experimental test is we have traction in the fiber direction, and in this case we have traction along following the bisector of the two fiber direction. So we have. Uh, it's a distance just between the fibers, and you have traction. In this case, as you shown before, you when you have when you have epoxy, it doesn't you have delamination. But we speak, you don't have delamination because you have woven ply, and of course, peak matrix. Um, I maybe um want to move to the one question that we already have from the audience. It's from Ben Sørensen asking about the Weibull modulus of 30 to 40 for the plies that Chaudong set, um, showed in his presentation, which is indeed high compared to the 
fibro modulus of fibers, which tends to be between five and 10. Um, and this question is how high should M be before we consider that there are no size scale effects in composites? Do we know whether how high M is for ductile metals? Uh, my first response to that would be how high? I think that's subjective. It depends on when you consider size scaling effects not to be significant. I think Michael, no, sorry, Chaudong showed that you have a 14% reduction. I remember you said, but then you're already a difference in volume of three orders of magnitude or something, something like that. That's already a very large difference in volume for, in a way, only a 14% reduction. Yes, so I think this is a very good question. I, I, I think Michael may have. Oh. <laughs> well, maybe we've lost him, so I don't know. Yeah, it looks like it. Uh, um, so yeah, so it depends, I suppose, how big a volume change you're looking at and, and how accurate you want to get. I think in many cases, you can ignore it and it's not too bad, but uh, but we've seen that by taking into account, we get much better correlation. And if you want to go from small test coupons up to very large structures, it may make quite a significant difference. I remember talking to people who were designing undersea cables, which uh, composite uh, reinforced cables, which are very, very long. And uh, they said they really need to take a effect uh, account of the fact that their kilometers long because it makes a big difference, the strength. Yeah, and with, with regards to what we have already discussed, when you're like putting two plies together, you're essentially doubling the volume. Yeah, that's small. Scaling, it should be just like one, two percent, according to the rules that Chow Dong has showed. So there it should not be very significant. Some of the effects we've highlighted, they are much more significant than this one or two percent. Does anybody want to comment on the how high M is for ductile metals, I have no clue, honestly, but I presume it's higher. And just don't know how to put that into a number. So I've seen some results which are not dissimilar. I mean, but fatigue is perhaps more of a, an issue with the metals when you, you do see quite a high um, variability in fatigue. Yeah. I, I have seen other values of this Weibull modulus for the plies, which was also 30, 40, 50 as a typical value. So this is definitely in the right range, I think, for composite plies. Yeah, we've seen it's, it's perhaps a bit lower for some different materials. So with a high strength rather than the intermediate modulus, it seems to be more like about 25. But uh, it's a range depending on the particular material, I think. Yeah. Okay, um, so now more questions are coming in. Um, the next question is from Ramesh Talrecha. Um, the comment is about triaxiality of stress state and epoxy in the interfiber region, so that was touched upon by Joel. It's important to note that triaxiality at a given point in the matrix is approximately fixed, so if a point reaches its cavitation limits, other points may be of different triaxiality. Thus, failure will occur at a point that reaches its brittle cavitation limit if not, then yielding occurs at a much higher energy level at other points. So anybody wants to respond to that? Perhaps Joel, since we talked about that rel related to his talk. Yeah, I think I think I'm, I mostly agree with that. It's a, it's a, it's a good analysis. Um, the, the, let's say if the fibers are uniformly spaced, uh, there's no reason for having an average triaxiality uh, uh, to a location or, or, or the other. However, with the fiber arrangement, we can have uh, close packing and uh, some regions where there's not much material left that can shear. So, so there, these are region of high triaxiality, and some others where where we have more space between the fibers where we have more shear. So, I guess that the, that's where also the, where the fiber distribution and the, the, the morphology, micro microstructure comes in as well. Anybody else wants to add to that question? It was not a very controversial point, so I yeah, guess there is no... Something yeah, to add is that uh, also fiber matrix adhesion is also controlling triaxiality. 
if there's fiber matrix debonding, there's no triaxiality or not much developing in the matrix. So yeah, that that's the problem is that it's very hard to measure these things. If we could, we could solve the problem. Okay, if there's, ah, uh, yeah, Richard, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in this ply thickness effect, though. I mean, there must be enough something about the the resin rich zone between plies, which is uh, driving that. Don't you think? Uh, is it, is it something to do with um, the different Poisson's ratio over that? zone compared to the ply thickness and that potentially initiating a crack, a delamination in the resin rich zone. Joel? So I don't know. Uh, yeah, so, sorry, uh, I was muted. Um, yeah, so so the first effect for ply thickness is, is, uh, is a volume to surface effect. Uh, so it means that uh, the the energy available to grow a crack uh, is somehow confined by the ply thickness. It's it's limited by the ply thickness, and uh, and and the, the the capacity to dissipate is a surface effect, and the energy is related to a volume. That's the, uh, the simplest explanation um, to explain this effect. It's not exactly that, but that's that captures the idea. So it's more like an available energy. So when 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 the ply is fracturing whether the available energy is sufficient to, to create this crack with respect to the toughness of the plant. Okay, so that's... So it's okay. due to the, the fact that the, 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 the crack is, is it's not opening also straight, it's opening in a, in a like, a, uh, yeah, it, it has the, the end uh, tied together. And then, so that's the, that's for the first mechanism. Okay. Then at the micro scale, it's more complicated. So that's the view of the mesoscale where you look at the ply uh, as an homogeneous material. At the micro scale, it's a bit more complicated. So I, I cannot really answer about the effect of resin rich zones. What, what we observed is in our models, uh, the, the debonding was always happening at the close packing region, so not really in the resin rich zones. And, and then propagating uh, through these weak spots, actually. Okay. Thanks. I think Elena wants to pick up on this. You are still muted, Elena. <laughs> yes, I'm not, I don't know if it reached a refer to what I'm going to explain, but our experience is the following. We have detected longitudinal debonds uh, in the interface between uh, the 90 degree block and the zero degree block. Uh, so they somehow, can be seen as the laminations, or yes, they uh, lead to the laminations. And uh, we have associated these longitudinal debonds to the edge effect. I mean, to the difference after curing between uh, the zero degree plies and the 90 degree plies. So we have studied the uh, stress state that we've got there, and we detect that there are some transverse crack in the perpendicular to the ratio, uh, perpendicular to the width in the y axis direction. So they, they will be the answer for this uh, longitudinal opening, perpendicular or parallel to the ply. So that's our experience. We have detected this um, um, longitudinal bonds also some, sometimes between plies in the region with rich areas. And uh, we have also seen them before testing, just after curing, in the case of very thin plies where the effect when you have got a 90 degree um, ply block very thin and zero degrees plies quite thick so that has appearance okay thanks okay um maybe we can move to the next question which is addressed to richard butler about the edge treatment and essentially wanting a little bit more details on what this edge treatment was this was also on my list so can you elaborate on that richard yeah. So for the experimental uh, tests we did um, with the corner bend uh, specimens and the short beam shear, uh, we used um, a tough resin, epoxy resin. I 
can't remember the details. They're in that paper um, that I refer to. Um, but we have to we have to be very careful about the adhering surface. So we plasma treat the the surface and um, make sure that it's um, it it accepts the bond very well. So that's that's the mechanical experimental work, and that showed improvements as I say up to about thirty percent of short beam shear strength with with that treatment. Numerically, uh, we don't have that problem. We just add a layer. I think it was one millimeter wide of material of the same modulus, so it's a laminate, but we allow no degradation. So it has the same stiffness as, as the laminate, but it has no degradation due to, to damage. So it's basically saying damage can't initiate from, from the edge numerically. So that's, does that answer the question? I would think it does. Um, I I can also share the link to the paper where you can find more details. Um, this was a 2016 paper um, that everybody should now be able to see in the chat. So now you'll get plenty of citations thanks to this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Zenzo, I, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you about yeah. uh, your transverse cracks and you in your model you mentioned that you weren't accounting for delamination and you said, I think, that, uh, that the delamination might increase the effect. Actually, I, I would have thought if it delaminates, that will reduce the effect of the stress concentration of the transverse crack. Can you comment uh, on that? Yeah, so um, we've had many very similar discussions on this related to when you have a fiber break and you get a debond. Um, it's very similar when you get a debond, the stress concentration factors on the surrounding fibers are also lower but they extend over a longer distance. And our experience has always been that the fact that they extend over a larger distance always tends to be more important than the fact that the peak stress concentration value is lower. And I think you will have the same effect here because you can essentially argue that the load that is being released by the transverse crack, it needs to go into the, nine, into the zero degree ply and so the only effect that you have is that that just gets spread out over a larger volume. And that is just a more significant effect than the peak value being a little bit lower. I don't have hard evidence for it, but all my experience in this type of problems has always shown that that effect is more significant. Thank you. Um, OK, there's another. Not a question, but a comment from Ramesh um, on ply thickness effect at the free edge. So I think everybody can read this, right? Um, but the free edge effects in, in plies. Yeah, so I think that's more or less what was already raised in the discussion as well. For thin plies, this, this can be a bit different and doesn't necessarily propagate over the entire width. Anybody else that wants to comment to the specific point that was now raised by Ramesh? Yeah, I'm sorry again, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, the, you you might be interested in the in the paper. Uh, uh, I will put a, a link here in the chat uh, from Sebastian Kohler. So he did this micro mechanic study that I showed very briefly, and uh, to capture the free edge effect, he did a simulation using plane strain condition, and for the bulk plane str uh, sorry, free edge was plane stress condition sorry, and for the bulk plane strain and using the same material parameter we, we could capture both the onset of uh, nucleation of the crack, uh, the free edge, and in the in the bulk. So, so this requires a, a lot of tuning, to be honest, of the parameters, because uh, we need to have the right sensitivity to hydrostatic pressure, what, what as all, was also mentioned. But these two stress states explain, uh, even with the same material low, we can explain the early appearance of the transverse crack at the free edge uh, compared to the bulk. Yeah. Um, 
I actually wanted to ask a question to Elena and uh, make a comment as well on kind of the difference between what she observed and what we what what I reported in my presentation. So one of the interesting things that is different between what we did is that you changed, you kept the same ply, um, the number of plies in zero degree and in 90 degrees, and you simply blocked them more together or less together, um, which I think is different from what we did. We simply kept the same number of zero degree plies on the outside, and we just made more and more 90 degree plies. Um, I think if you the way you do it, you get also um, you avoid sort of volumetric effects, the direct size effect, but you change the constraining effect that you have by separating the plies over multiple smaller ply blocks. But I think that's just an interesting difference that you're combining constraining effects with the effects of transverse cracking, and it's it's difficult to do to completely isolate them. So that that was a bit the the comment which you can also respond to in a minute, but. I was also interested in your observations where you have these fiber breaks um, where you can see them in one case and you don't see them in the other case. I was wondering, do you see them that they tend to be at the tips of the transverse cracks like we have found, or do you see them just as appearing more, more randomly independent of the tips of the transverse cracks? You are muted, Elena. You were unmuted, but you muted yourself. Yes, sorry. <laughs> it's different from the uh, application I'm used to uh, use. Uh, yes, well, two parts of the question. No? The second, I start by the end. No, um, no we, we haven't studied this, this effect very deeply so far, but we haven't seen, that, that was very interesting to me, and uh, we haven't seen that effect on the, uh, each of the transverse class with in connection with the uh, fibers. No, they are more randomly. And we, just to say that we see fiber breakage both in the thick case and in the thin case. Although in the thick case, they are much more, I mean, much many than in the other case. So we don't see, we haven't seen that, that connection. Um, referring to the first part of, of your speech, uh, yes, of course, it's a completely different case what you have shown and we, we have shown, although this 20% decrease, I don't know, I think it's a casualty. I mean, it's uh, it's not, um, it's just a coincidence. We agree in this is a decrease in the uh, strength. And um, now your cases, the cases you were um, showing, we studied them before, but we studied them focusing mainly in the appearance of the first damage. And of course, we have seen this reduction in the in the strength when the transverse damage appears. I mean, when, when the, uh, in the case of the thick laminates, you can see that, that reduction. I think, of course, those studies, yours and ours are different, but I think they have points in connection. I've seen clear points there. So I think it's interesting to compare them. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, Elena. Um, then I'll give the word to Tomonaga Okabe. Go ahead. Can I say uh, uh, can I say one comment for the viable modulus? So the audience asked us, so uh, 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 shall don't show the laminate with viable modulus M of 30 to 40. So this is quite high in comparison with fibers. So, but so if you think about uh, the bundle strength, it becomes much higher than uh, the uh, individual original fibers, young modules. So statistical model or mathematician have already proved it. So then uh, if we want to know that, so then uh, I hope you to check the uh, for example, Professor Phoenix's uh, review or paper and so on. Even if so, I would like to say one more thing. So, you know, the, as today I told you, so then the, I, I can uh, the predict the average strength of UD composite, 
using the Springer model, or if you want to use the other model, that's okay. Probably the average stress can be predicted. But so if you use the such kind of a model, so viable modulus is much higher than 30 to 40, you know. So most important thing, so, you know, uh, Average stress can be predicted from a viewpoint of the micromechanics, but it means that shape function, shape, uh, shape parameter can be predicted using the uh, micromechanical model. But wiring modulus cannot be predicted. So from a micromechanics, if you do the Monte Carlo simulation, simulated to one wiring modulus is much much higher than the uh, down 40. So, so I, I understand, uh, so to uh, put uh, honest, uh, so you know, the, actually, so I published uh, several paper 2002 uh, or 15 years ago. So uh, I tried to uh, predict the cross by laminates or and so on. So the Yentl, uh, today Yentl showed my paper's results. So I, I understand, so that is very important. Over, uh, so uh, additionally, I think, so then the, so to predict the young modulus, uh, this is because uh, uh, it, so young modulus is mainly control the size of volume effect or the tensile strength. So if you think about the notch uh, laminate, so then the, such kind of uh, viable vib modulus is quite important factor to predict the strength accurately. So Professor Hallett, Professor Wisnam did very nice work. I confirm. But so then currently we have to do the experiments so to get the viable modulus. So, so this is quite big problem for us to predict the uh, composite strength. So I would like to say about that. So that's all. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I can confirm that indeed the viable modulus by Predicted by fiber break models, it tends to be significantly high. In some cases, I've seen Weibel much less of 80, 90, 100, which really is a lot higher than the 30, 40, 50 that you see in experiments. And I think certainly you can blame the models. I think it's also intrinsically very difficult um, to measure this experimentally because any sort of um, scatter that you intrinsically have in, in experiments is also going to change the viable modules that you measure. So um, I think the biggest part is on the fiber break models that do not capture all the variability and scatter that's inherent in composites. But I don't think the, the actual experiments are completely perfect either. Um, OK, maybe I'll give the word to Dan Adams then. Yeah, so I had a, a question for um for the panel and for anybody else listening. So, so the, the workshop, uh, when it was advertised, mentioned um, the relationship between uh, unidirectional uh, compression strength and uh, strength of laminates. And the question being that, can you get the unidirectional compression strength by from, from laminates? And so um, from a US perspective, I guess, I think I'm, the only panelist that would represent ASTM, for example, and um, CMH17, Composite Materials Handbook. Um, I would say the use of cross-ply laminates is creeping into the acceptable range in the sense that, as I mentioned in my talk, this uh, NCAMP database that's now publicly available, if you look carefully at it, the compression strengths for some material systems are generated using cross-ply laminates. So my question is just generally speaking, where do we stand in the European community in terms of um, uh, using cross-ply laminates for uh, obtaining the unidirectional compression strength? Is it accepted? Is it, is it recognized? Is it in any of the standards? 
Uh, maybe just a first quick response is that we do use quite a lot of ASTM standards here, even though we're not American. Sure. So it is very common here. Um, anybody else wants to comment on the more particular point raised by Dan? Federico, I'm not sure you're raising your hand because of this. Yeah, yeah, go ahead then. But unmute yourself. Sure. Okay. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a very, very interesting point. We were discussing the three organizers yesterday uh, this point because for, for us, this sick uh, edition is probably the most important, because, uh, independently of the first, of course, because during the, the previous four editions, we were discussing the uh, isolated determination or estimation of the properties. Now the question was obvious. Are we able to predict the strength of a laminate based on previous um, problems? My impression is that um, we have um, evidences of different effects that affect the strength of the laminate. The matter and the problem for me is that we do not have physically based explanations about most of them. Without this, we cannot improve uh, the, the, the performance of a laminate. The problem for me is that to have physically based explanations, a full, complete, not a model, a full explanation just based on uh, elasticity theory and foundations of fracture mechanics, that's all. To have this is not easy and can take uh, plenty of, uh, of years. Now, what we are doing, I, I think in Europe and in America and in all cases, as, um, and there are several colleagues of mine from Airbus company attending this meeting, is that um, I just trust in what uh, I get from an experiment. And uh, if finally, I have to put one laminate in one component that I'm going to put in an aircraft, I just test it. And with this, I will have my answer, but I'm almost sure that the, the 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 option finally will not be optimized because we do till we have no physically based explanation of, of the phenomena we are observing mechanisms of damage etc we will not be able to optimize a laminate michael yes yeah, so uh, we originally posed the question about whether you can go from the ud strength to the laminate Dan, you're going the opposite way around. Can you test the laminate and back calculate the unidirectional properties? And the whole question really is, is are they the same? And in many cases, it seems they are quite similar, despite some of the subtle effects that we've been discussing. But we've seen today several examples where there are actually rather, diff rather large differences. And so I, I think we absolutely need to understand the reasons for these so we can be sure that whichever way we're going, whether it's from UD to laminate or laminate to UD, we're, we're doing a, a good thing. And there's, there's clearly a few effects here which are not widely understood. And uh, this really leads me on perhaps to the next point, which I, I'll throw out now, the discussion is, well, what will industry make of all this? Because we're taking a very fundamental look at this. We really want to understand what's happening. What are the factors controlling it? But if you've got to design structures, you need to use values, and it's clearly quite confusing. And you're not able to take necessarily account of all these things. So to what extent can industry pick up this and, and use the approach in a way to make sure that it's conservative? Sorry, and I think Frederick wants to respond to this. Um, not really a response, but just make a comment. We, we talk about the, the performance in corporation, but from the industrial point of view, uh, there is a, the average value, but also the scattering is very important because when you design a composite structure, you are going to take the allowables. Therefore, when you propose uh, an experimental protocol, the idea is to obtain obviously the highest strength, which should be close to what you want to measure, but also with a small scattering in order to use a high value in the design. And I think we have to, um, have in mind that we need a high value and also a small scattering. And if you have a small scattering, it means that you master the boundary condition of your test and you obtain the relevant failure mode. And that's not an easy task, but that's a part of the problem. I mean, not just the high value, also the scattering. Yeah, 
And I, I would respond to that also, Frederick, that you, in some cases, I, I agree that you want a high value, a high mean value, but that's maybe not always that obvious. And um, there might be cases where a high value is actually an overestimation. I agree in most cases, it will actually be an underestimation what we measure, but not that might not be true in all cases. Um, I, Xiao Dong has been raising his hand for a while. I think you wanted to raise another point, right? Or is it related to this discussion? No, I want to. I want to address Dan's comment. Uh, if okay, very yeah, brief. Yes, thank you. So I think I think it, for specific case, yes, and I I do uh, use this um, back out factor in my own work. So which is about two point five for quasi isotropic uh, laminates. So uh, about uh, the. The condition is to eliminate these edge delamination. So then we can make sense of the QI strengths from UD. So that's that's the point of um, uh, that paper. Uh, now I do uh, see a lot of uh, uh, similar considerations in your compression case. For example, you said if we test uh, cross plies, we don't need n -tabs. That's exactly what I did because I found using n -tabs for quasi isotropic is not helpful. So I think that there are lots of uh, similar considerations between our cases. And I also uh, want to comment on Michael and Professor Okebe's uh, comment on uh, measuring Weibo uh, modulus. So I think actually uh, reliable experiments is, is very hard. I mean, Michael's work uh, using very uh, interesting tab design just to get that Weibo modulus uh, um, reliable. And I stick with the M7 because I don't want to repeat the work from other materials. So I think it's very difficult to measure it accurately. And I do appreciate Michael's hard work. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, reliable experimental results is, is crucial. Thank you. Yeah, which is why some of our previous workshops has tried to address how you do this in tension, how you do this in compression. Um, they all have their own challenges, even for pure UDs. And this also affects the whole discussion here. If you don't have a reliable value for the UD strength, then how are you going to assess how a laminate is different and how these effects of other ply orientations? If you don't have a reliable reference value, it's very difficult to make this analysis. And that's something I think we should never forget when we're doing this type of interpretation, that the reference value may not even be the right value and may also be affected by artifacts. Costas, go ahead. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Everybody's shaking their head. No? We see you. Oh, you see me? Yeah. All right. Let me see. Yes, now it's solid. Yes, now we see. Like you see both guys now. You see, you see my screen, and you see. Yeah. Okay. So here we can see uh, the failure stress of two different quasi-isotropic laminates in compression. The top one, the zero plies are uniformly dispersed through the thickness. The bottom one is the blocked layer. And if you use um, Dan's backout factor for the dispersed zero plies, you will get uh, the UD strength of around 1600 megapascals, which we have measured that in uh, UD specimens, which is very difficult actually to to achieve, uh, provided you take into account all the things that we have discussed. And if you do that, and in that UD laminate, uh, we did waste through the thickness, we achieved uh, a UD strength uh, of 1630 megapascals, which is the strength that you get from this quasi-strobic layer. Once you block the plies, you have uh, a ply thickness effect. And as you can see, it starts getting reduced uh, for thicker uh, plies together. 
And here, at the bottom of the 288, uh, something else is happening. This is the, the thick laminate where the plies are blocked. Uh, as it comes out from the autoclave, you don't see, that's a C-scan, an ultrasonic C-scan, you don't see any damage, you don't see any issues there. But once we started cutting the specimens in order to test them in our test uh, apparatus, you can see below, and we scanned the individual specimens, uh, they were cracked. You had extensive uh, matrix cracking along the off-axis splice and the zero plies and everything. And of course, that affects the stability of the zero plies and uh, the fiber instability occurs at much lower applied load, which leads to a lower strength of your MD laminate. Uh, yeah, so specimen preparation clearly is very important and not everybody will check this with C-scan after the specimens are cut. Correct, correct. And that's, that's what we have uh, observed that this is what we have seen. And of course, in this case, uh, uh, all the UD and MD laminates were tested under exactly the same conditions with the same test fixture and uh, uh, quite quite large specimens, trying to avoid the, the small tiny specimens that people use, say, for UD measurement of the strength and that kind of thing. Uh, also, what we have observed, uh, just by testing 100% UD laminates, you can see the, the thin laminate, the traditional two millimeter thick laminate, which is suggested by ASTM standards and ISO standards. It gives you the 1630 megapascals with very small scatter, provided that your specimens are fabricated correctly, tested correctly by experienced operator. And then as you increase the thickness of the specimen, you, you get all these other things, huge reduction. And here we have a kind of uh, an empirical formula that shows you the ultimate strength of the laminate compared to the two millimeters thick laminate times the thickness of the laminate where alpha there is 0.25 and it fits, it fits that curve. Uh, Costas, I think your, um, your short presentation is raising a lot of hands, so I would give the, the floor to, to Michael first to respond to some of the points you're making. Well, just to, to talk quickly about this one, uh, it's much harder to get the load into a thicker specimen. So I think it's 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 really a bit difficult to say whether what we're seeing here is a, a material size effect or it's not just an effect of the testing. And, and I suspect that, uh, that, there's a, that, that that's a big effect. The point I really wanted to raise was some of the earlier points both Xiaodong and you, Yentl, commented about the difficulty of measuring the viral modulus. So actually, uh, uh, Gergé Seol has developed this, um, this hybrid test with glass carbon sandwich, and uh, it's a very easy test to do. And he has, he has done scale tests, which don't require any very careful specimen preparation, just a, just a normal laminate um, preparation. And that enables the viable modulus to be done to be determined from scale tests, which then reduces the effect of the individual variability within the test. If you just try to look at the scatter on the tests and try and relate that to a viable modulus, then it's really difficult to separate the, the viable modulus due to material variability and testing. But if you test different size specimens, then you can back it out quite well. Yeah, so some good points there, Michael. Uh, from uh, our experience, we observed that the, the thicker UD laminates, they showed a higher uh, void content and also higher uh, fiber misalignment, waviness, uh, which of course then uh, it, you go back to trying to understand why the reduction and then of course waviness, we've seen that the compressive strength is very sensitive to, to fiber waviness, but also to fiber misalignment, plus to ply undulation. So you have all these other uh, factors as you go to thicker and blocked layups, you introduce all those imperfections during your fabrication process, which you don't get yeah. as much 
when you uniformly disperse your plies through the thickness of the laminate. That's a good point, yeah. Um, okay, there's two more raised hands. If if one of the two is related to the topic that Costas was presenting, maybe that one goes first, I, or, or is, if it's both related. Um, yeah, go ahead, Frederick. Yeah, it is definitely related. Okay. Um, at the beginning of this workshop, uh, Michael Wisdom showed results that we have obtained in the PhD thesis of Tamas Rev for very thin ply. So with a tensile test which failed in completion, we have test very thin ply. I think it was uh, 40 microns thick. And my question for Costas, have you tried with your model to go down into the thickness and see if you have a plateau or another increase? Because the confinement due to the other ply will play a, a very strong role on the buckling of just few fibers in it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that um, the, the Timoshenko beam that we've seen earlier uh, can capture um, this um, very thin ply, ply, ply thickness effect. Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't, haven't, we haven't looked at that. Um, I would also caution you to be very careful because the, the degree of alignment could also be quite different the more spread out the toes are. So um, you could test this by just blocking thin plies together, but if you have really a different ply thickness to start with, this is not easy to, to really interpret the data. It becomes, it becomes really hard, it becomes really hard. Yeah, my question was really to block them and to have the same process and see yeah. if you have obtained a plateau or if, if there is still uh, an increase after yeah, that. I mean, the, the thinnest we did go down on the dispersed layup was uh, the uh, two plies thick, where the ply is 125 microns, so we're looking at about uh, 250 micrometers. Okay. Um, and the effect that we've seen, it was as you go now to three, four, five, Lies blocked together, so rather than the other way down. Um, so we are we are approaching the end of the discussion point. If people from the audience still have questions, please put them in the Q and A section. I'll give the word to, to Professor Kabe. Oh, I'm sorry. So I would like to again stick to the wiper motor. So then the size effect of the zero degree pry is very critical for predicting the composite strength. So then. Uh, as the Shaudo and um, Maya course shows, the Weber modulus becomes 40 for the, the quasi isotropic and the UD. I think it's not a coincidence. So, this, I think there is a physical, uh, there is an underlying physical mechanism. So, I think this is just a comment. So, that this would be an important issue for young generation to make a micro mechanics. So this is because, so Xiaodong said, so, you know, the, to, to do the experiment accurately, it's, it's very tough work. So if so, then we have to solve the so underlying physical mechanism. So then the, to, to get such kind of number, so correctly, that is quite important. So. This is my comment. I mean, when, when, when I look at uh, micrographs of my colleagues, metallurgists, uh, their, their material at the micro level is, 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 is perfect. When we look at micrographs of uh, UD, UD composites, uh, it's, it's, it's a mess. When you look at the viable uh, modulus for aluminum or steel, the value is nine hundred. Is nine hundred? So you know the UD composite includes a lot of fibers. So then the you know if you think about the statistical effect, so then the so average value and the, you know the scattering number is so convert to the certain value. So then that that has been already proved by the, a lot of mathematicians. So then I don't think so. I don't agree with you. Yeah, but M, M equal 40 for UD, I think it's quite high, it's quite good. 
metals is 90 hundred. It's really high value. So the quality of the material is completely, okay, completely I, different I, level. Yeah, yeah. So the, the topic is quite different from the metal. So this is just the fiber blockage problem. So that's different, I, th I think. Yeah. I would interpret that as a positive thing. That means we still have a lot of room for improvement. <laughs> Um, no, no. Also, 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 those imperfections which cause uh, localized damage, uh, you, you, they dissipate energy. So it's a, a energy absorption mechanisms. They are energy sinks, and that's that's the good thing. Yes, <laughs> correct. Always stay positive. <laughs> um, if there are any final points that anybody wants to make um, before we go to the conclusions and next topics for workshops. No. Um, the, next, the next topic probably has to be digital design, at, you know, and AI powered uh, modeling of all, all these composites that we're discussing and develop, you know, a system where industry can use as a tool to speed up the design process. We've seen that uh, 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 digital design has been already introduced in manufacturing. Uh, we can do that probably at the material level and connect that to the manufacturing aspect. Okay, uh, but I, I first wanted to go a little bit towards the conclusions um, before going into the next topics. Um, so we will get we will get to that. Um, I think maybe a concluding statement that I would add based on everything we've discussed so far is that even though we have focused more on the experimental side. I think some of these things that we are trying to understand the effect of layups on strength, I don't think we can answer a lot of those questions purely from an experimental point of view because of all the artifacts, the scatter involved in experiments. And I think it's really important to try to model some of these effects so that we can also really fundamentally understand how the effect of layup affects compression strength of a laminate, uh, tensile strength, and so on. And this is just I don't think this is completely possible purely experimentally. Anybody else wants to add some concluding statements? So I'd just like to comment on the need for more really good tests. So we've seen this afternoon quite a few cases where there have been results potentially in conflict. And I think now we're getting to the point where we do have some better test methods. And we can do some more well-controlled experiments to compare some of these different cases. So that's something definitely I plan to, to, to try to push forward to, to get some more reliable results to answer some of the questions we've raised so that then we can know the limitations of the simple approaches, which is what industry would like to use, but we want to make sure that there's not cases where it's going to be unconservative. And I would like to add, before, before we test those specimens, we have to make sure that we know the, the condition of those specimens before they are being tested in terms of uh, uh, fabrication induced defects, which again, they're going to alter uh, the evolution of your damage and uh, your ultimate strength that you're trying to characterize and measure. So the, the initial condition of your specimens before they are tested you need to know that. Otherwise, all those things that we've, we spoke about, void content, resonant regions, uh, misalignments, undulations, all that have a huge impact uh, on your damage evolution and uh, uh, the behavior of uh, your specimens. Yeah, I agree. I think that's very important. And uh, we, we, yes, we, we need to understand the effects of those defects because it's clearly is very big in some cases. Um, and um, I would also add that the, in comparing tensile versus compression for laminate strength, I get the sense that we already better understand this problem in tension than in compression. So I think there's really still more work to be done to understand the effect of layup on compression strength. I was very pleased to see that Dan was reporting that in cross-plies, that seems to be okay. 
But as soon as you go to other more complex layups with fewer zero degree plies, then maybe it's a little bit more tedious to, to back out the compression strength. So are we ready to allow cross pie testing in uh, standardized test methods for compression? Provided, provided that the zero applies to not on the surface. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good point. So the one thing that still bothers me about the, the back out is the nonlinearity, because uh, uh, in carbon it, it, it's quite high, and um, I feel that to 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 do a back out calculation, we ought to be taking account of the nonlinear response of the carbon fibers, which is something that is very often or nearly always ignored in practice, and and how nonlinear it is. It's also not been characterized very extensively in my experience, especially not in compression, where this is intrinsically also more difficult to do. I mean, Richard, Richard Butler uh, earlier, he mentioned some kind of treatment uh, of the edge effect. In some earlier work, when uh, we were looking at uh, uh, edge delaminations and the effect of edge delaminations uh, on uh, uh, behavior of multidirectional laminates, we've noticed that uh, if we polish the edge of the of the specimen, uh, matrix cracking happens at much higher higher strain. Instead of getting matrix cracks at um, uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 percent strain, 3,000, 4,000 micro strains, it goes going up to 6,000 micro strains, and that makes huge difference in the damage evolution of. Uh, uh, medics cracking and edge delamination. Yeah, I think that has been reported indeed by many people. If you want to observe, you typically polish. That's probably also what Elena did in her in her test that they were polished on before, and otherwise you cannot do proper optical microscopy on yeah, the. Yeah, but edge. then straight away it changes it changes the the, the, the evolution of damage. <laughs> Which I think also just emphasizes that some of the studies needs to be done in three D rather than in two D at the edge. Yeah, I would like also to say that uh, I agree with Michael about the necessity of doing more experimental work, but I would add experimental oriented work, which means that uh, the lack I find is that, or I'm finding is that uh, we need to identify the problems we don't understand about the strength of the laminates. And then to perform this experimental work, but oriented to try to understand the reasons why this problem appear. Experiments oh, with purpose. Experiments with purpose. <laughs> yes. So obviously, the list of problems we don't understand may be unbound. So the list can be infinite. But at least we should be able to identify something that is important for the industry. And then to try to make oriented tests to try to understand the problem. Yeah. And just like with anything in science, it also needs to be replicated then by other labs on other materials. Like this cross ply effect was shown by Dan quite nicely on one particular material. Does it also hold in other materials? Does it hold for glass fiber or is it just for carbon fiber? If you want to put it into a standard, you need to have duplicated the results several times in different material combinations at different labs. And you obviously cannot rely on one set of data. I know it's it was not one set of data. It actually was already for multiple labs. So that definitely makes that, that conclusion a lot stronger. Um, Richard. Yeah, it was really just to come back with this edge treatment. Um, I think if, if the coupon has an edge effect, you polish it and it improves. You, you adhere a resin to it very carefully and it improves still more. It's showing that the edge effect is there, and the numerical analysis is what shows you how 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 big it is, how significant it is. It is, and therefore, if you want to remove the edge effect, you can do it numerically, um, and then you can look at what the effect of the stress concentration or failure from the internal structure is. And uh, I think we need to be careful that the, the test isn't flawed as a result of these edges. Um, yep, agreed. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. 
Okay, unless there's any more urgent concluding statement, I would propose we move into the final part, which is um, discussion of the, the topics for the next workshop. Maybe I'll give Elena the word first, probably still on a concluding statement. Yes, uh, I agree with Richard. And also, I would also add that um, you can also do the other way. I mean, you can take into account the edge effect in your models just by considering a 3D model instead of a plain model. So it's quite easy. Yeah, if you can handle the computational effort that is increased. Of course, <laughs> of course. Yes. Okay. Um, We've already heard a brief comment by Costas at the start about uh, topics for the next workshop. Um, anybody else wants to comment on whether this should continue, how it should continue, how you see the future of this line of workshops? I would like to say that in my opinion, we have finished it one cycle. So we have closed one part of these uh, initial ideas we had, considering that uh, we want to check the influence of, uh, or the representativity of the values obtained at the level of lamina in a laminate. Now a big number of possibilities appear. One of them is, for instance, obviously fatigue. By the way, Marino has asked me to remind you that uh, the International Conference of of uh, uh, fatigue composite is still open. You can send your contributions, okay? <laughs> fatigue is one. Uh, impact, behavior and the impact is also important. Uh, the uh, holes, because there are many problems associated with this. So the decision now, in my opinion, is to hear what you have to, to say about this. We, we, we appreciate uh, very much everything you can say to discuss not only about the next, but about a, a whole set of uh, future uh, seminars, if you consider these are of interest for the community. Yes, I mean, the, the open whole aspect uh, is quite important because at the end of the day, when we look at the industry and when they design, they never use the UD strength or the MD and not strength, but the open whole, compression in the hot, wet, uh, cold environments, <laughs> which dictates then uh, not sensitivity, impact, damage tolerance, and so on and so forth. Yeah, anybody else? So let's go for the open hole. <laughs> Um, maybe also just something to mention that um, sort of the outcome of this, the first and the second workshop um, on the definition of strength and the tensile strength part, we are running this round robin, which we've mentioned a couple of times. So the specimens are almost finished and will be sent out to all the testing labs in the next few weeks. So hopefully in a couple of months, we will actually get all the results in and then maybe we can also do something around presenting the outcome of that, that round robin and discussing the implications uh, of, of that round robin. But those, those results, are they going to have the original state of the specimen before testing? Um, well, in principle, all the specimens are prepared very identical. So but they're inside, just different. Inside, inside the specimen, what's inside? Um, we don't have anything planned at the moment to assess this, but it's a good suggestion. We should do at least a few CT scans to see what the exact state is, what the quality level is. I mean, certainly optical microscopy was definitely planned by some participants just to, to check. And in certain cases will be needed also for the continuous tab design with the hybrids to see what the relative ratio is. Um, but yeah, it's a good suggestion. Thanks, Costas. Um, Lars wants to add a point. Um, I will allow him to talk so you can unmute Alex. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Good. Uh, I was thinking about uh, the other topic. Now we have looked at uh, UD uh, properties and tension and compression and, and different modes. Uh, what about linking the, the constituents 
properties to the composite properties, we haven't really addressed that. So, so yeah, measure the the properties of the fiber in a matrix, and then from that uh, predict the, the 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 properties of the composites. The, so I think that's a very interesting point, very close to my heart, Lex. Um, I I think there the challenge might be that a lot of the the analysis there would come from models and a little bit less from experiments. I there is certainly some information from experiments out there, but I think the more clear information on that will probably come from the models, which um so far our workshops have really focused <coughs> more on the experimental side and sometimes using models to understand experimental issues. We've we've deliberately steered away a little bit from too much towards the modeling sides. Uh, but I think it's a very interesting remark. We'll discuss that yeah. more with Federico and, and Michael. Uh, just to add that, uh, that of course, uh, it's, it's very much modeling, but it's modeling models which need additional input, not only the properties of the fiber matrix, but also some microstructural uh, properties which are, are can be experimentally based from X-ray or microscope or, yeah, so, so that's, number of new inputs poss possibilities which can be used in, in models maybe in a more clever the way than than we have done so far so i i think there's a new uh, yeah uh, type of uh, of experiments uh, where we can yeah put more information in, into the models yeah that's definitely very active in my own research um any anybody else wants to add something Yes, Richard. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree that that should be the way that we, uh, we are, we are moving as a community to try and uh, capture micro, um, micro mechanical behavior, uh, and then be able to upscale that to structural or, um, meso mesoscale properties, um, particularly if the environment. The harshness of environments, for instance, uh, cryogenic temperatures, uh, um, high cycle fatigue. If, if we if we want to move away from a coupon world, uh, we should we should be able to upscale properties from the micro scale. That would make everything a lot more efficient if you can just change the matrix properties and you have a model that tells you what that will do to tensile and compression strength. It would save. A lot of people a lot of time but it's still a very challenging task at the moment i think i saw that friedrich also wanted to mention something yeah it's related finally when you try to go up into the scale the effect of defect is also a point which is you have to consider the only good news is when you have a defect you are going to fail with the defect and no more in the jaws so for once you have one advantage but you have to take into account the defect and what i found interesting in that topic is that if you want to simulate it you have to observe it for instance for initial waviness and you must perform experiments and simulation at the same time and a workshop on that you will see really a dialogue between test and simulation very strong otherwise you cannot treat um, such a, a topic so i think it could be interesting for the community yeah, and I think and I think this is where techniques like say the X-ray CC community tomography can give you not just a value for the void coordinate say of one percent. Yeah, it gives you the distribution. It gives you the size of the pores and the shape and the direction to the principal loading directions. Because again, you might have uh, voids that they're passive; they don't contribute anything, but they might be other voids uh, where there are sharper edges which are perpendicular to the loading axis and they can become critical. So the information from what's inside is so critical and it's not just a, an average fiber waveness, it's the distribution of fiber waveness and where are they located. So it's the, it's the location as well and how those uh, fabrication induced defects are introduced and they interact. So you need to have a map. You need to have a map of what's internally. If you don't have that, whatever you model is going to be based uh, on uh, uh, calibrations. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
I think we should more or less conclude here. Lars, do you want to still make a point before we really wrap up? No, I forgot to lower my ah, Okay, okay, fine. Um, yeah, then I think we should conclude here. Um, it's six o'clock here, it's five o'clock in the UK. Um, so we promise to conclude here. Um, once we have uploaded the recording to YouTube, we will send out an email to everybody who has registered um, so that you receive the slides and the link to the YouTube recording if you want to look at some of the specific discussions again. And um, yeah, when we have another workshop planned, you are all on the mailing list, so we will make sure you're all notified and also feel free to share this with your colleagues if you receive an invitation for a next workshop. So thank you very much, especially to all our speakers and to everybody who stayed on until the end uh, from the audience. And thank you very much. See you next time, hopefully. And also to thank Igendo for uh, all mm -hmm. the effort he put in to organize us and of course all the other organizers and, uh, right. and the audience who at attended today. You're very welcome, Costas. Enjoy thank your you. evening, guys.